that's great. All right, well, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm gonna officially call this meeting to order. Uh, so the first item is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I don't think I have any information uh, about changing it. I know John had some sent around information about the liquor licenses, but that is otherwise in the consent agenda. Um, any uh, others have thoughts on the agenda? Additions? Oh, Bill, go ahead. One question. Um, Alec Ellsworth has sent around some information about um, potential land purchase, and he will be available later in the meeting if you want to go into executive session to discuss that. Otherwise, the information that he sent is there. So we could add that on if that's something you'd like to do. Uh, one question I have about that is uh, what, uh, is there a urgent reason to put it on for tonight? Like, is there a deadline or anything? I'm not aware that there is. I think it's just, you know, it's real estate, so it's moving, so. Right, right. Okay. Um, thoughts about that, team? It would be okay with me to, wait, to put it on our next meeting instead of tonight. Okay. We're kind of busy um, tonight. Yeah, I was going to say, my anticipation is that this meeting is going to be kind of a long one, so I think my that would also was, be my... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Donna. It, does it involve money in the coming year that we need to think about allocating within our context of our budget? It does, but we weren't going to make any requests in the budget. So it would be how to... There was going to be discussion of money, but not with the change to the budget. So whatever that needs to be done doesn't have to be done next year. So we don't have to worry about money for next year. Well, they're, you know, we're already getting into some details. So there, there's a, the short answer is we were not going to ask to increase the budget. Okay. For this project. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's um, plan to have it as a, an agenda item for next time. If it's not too full, I don't have a recall if that is already very full already, but um not like tonight okay <laughs> let's let's do that i think that would be good um all right any other thoughts on the agenda okay so without objection we will consider the agenda approved uh, so on to general business and appearances this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda um, if you do have comments on an agenda item, you can make those um, when we take those up. Uh, but otherwise, if there's something else you'd like to address the council about, now would be a good time to do that. And uh, what's true for this time, as well as any other following public comment, is if you would say your name, um, where you live, and try to keep your comments to two minutes. That would be fantastic. Um, all right, so is there anyone who would like to address the council? You can either physically wave, raise your hand, or make a react emoji. And if you are on phone, you can hit star six to unmute. Uh, Steve Whitaker here. All right, um, Stephen, go ahead. I want to just relay for you what I consider a tragic emergency. Uh, and it's in addition to the ongoing bathroom problem. Um, I spent three over three hours today uh, on behalf of a passerby whom I noticed his story is he got out of Newport. Uh, he's got a wife and kid he can't stay with. And he stayed outside last night. And it was like, what, two or eight degrees or something like that. And so I spent hours today calling Don, calling, you know, Ken Russell, another way director, uh, calling, talking to Will Everly, and in the tens of millions of dollars that have been spent, this guy doesn't have a phone, by the way. He doesn't have a working phone, doesn't have a place to live, doesn't have transportation. And all of this combined horsepower and salary and committees and task forces and meetings and minutes could do nothing for this guy. He walked away 
after three hours of me doing my best, uh, just totally disheartened and, and despondent that this is the best we can do. And, you know, you may see him wandering around Montpelier tonight if you want to go out, but I just think that this is more serious than you take it, you know? And I'm calling on you to recognize that we have literally failed miserably, you know? Um, I don't know what more to say. I mean, what the only offer Will had was there's a spot up in Morrisville or Hyde Park if he can get there, you know? But he has to be back here in for an appointment in the morning. So even if he could get there, there's no way to get back in time for an appointment. So you really don't take seriously how this crisis is, but when a body shows up, you will, you know? And I just, I, I, you've been hearing about it from me so long, your ears are clogged. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Stephen. And it's, it is actually good to know um, what's happening, you know, on, on the street. Um, I mean, there was, uh, Don said there was one room. Go ahead, Stephen. Okay. All right. Um, thank Mayor, you. I did. He was interrupting. That's funny. So she, I did. she can mute me, but she can't unmute me. That's pretty clever. Oh, okay. Uh, no worries. Go ahead, uh, Stephen. It's over. Okay. So Don said there was one room at Econo Lodge, and I said, find a way, find a petty cash something. Another way says he can come here and make phone calls to call to economic services, but we're going to throw him out the door at five o'clock. And, and, and by the way, economic services closes at four thirty. And I'm like, is this the best you can do? I've said, somebody find some petty cash, get the guy in the O'Connor lodge and we'll work out the paperwork tomorrow. You know, nobody could do anything. So when, when I plead with you to realize this is, this is, we, we are better than this, you know? We, we, we have to recognize that this is a humanity thing. This isn't politics. This isn't, you know, kick the can down the road or say, we don't know how to do social services. This is a human emergency. So we came so close, and the guy walked out and is sleeping outside somewhere in Montpelier tonight, you know? So that's, I'm sorry, I took more than like two minutes, but I feel I'm okay. pretty upset. Yeah, no, fair enough. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Rick, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, this is uh, Rick DeAngelis, and uh, I live in Montpelier. I'm the director of the Good Samaritan Haven. Uh, Steve, if you want to contact me offline, either by email or phone, I'd be glad to pay for a room at the O'Connell Lodge on behalf of the Good Samaritan Haven. So uh, I wasn't aware of this situation. And uh, we can, uh, we'll do everything that we can to get that gentleman inside. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, so we're going to move on then to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I move it. To accept. <clears throat> Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion uh, about this? Oh, I do have one uh, comment uh, or a question. Ahead, yeah. And that is that <clears throat> for some of the financial uh, documents, um, Kelly's been able to set something up so we could, uh, council members can sign electronically. And I wonder if it's possible to do that same thing for the uh, liquor licenses, or do those have to be signed on a physical piece of paper even during the uh, state of emergency? Um, at, no, I can't bring up videos. Sorry. I hope you all can hear me. Yep. At this yep. point, um, there's nothing nothing to be done about it. Um, but the, the conversation is up. I'll push a little harder on that um, and see. But right now, it's got to be physical. OK, thanks, Sam, because in court, we're we're not signing hand, hand signing documents in court where courts are accepting electronic signatures and it seems crazy if the liquor control commission doesn't yeah it's a little scattershot um right now but i'll lean on them thanks okay thank you All right so there's been a motion and a second um uh, any further discussion on the consent agenda 
Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> and opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes uh, and um, we are gonna move on to um, a series of appointments. So there are uh, a few appointments to be made here and the way we're gonna um, move through this time is that I'd love to have any of the folks who are up for this appointment to, or um, for any of these appointments, uh, that includes to the uh, uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee, to the Police Review Committee, uh, or to the Housing Authority. Uh, if any of those candidates would um, uh, introduce themselves and tell us about your interest in that committee, um, then we will go into executive session and uh, uh, come out with uh, recommendations for appointments um, on on all of those uh, committees together. Um, having said that, I think it makes sense for us to go sort of uh, orderly through them. So for the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, are Kate McCann or Christian uh, Mayer on the call? I don't necessarily see them, but it's possible that that they're still here. Okay, I'm gonna, and Cameron, you're not seeing anyone raise their hand or anything, right? I'm gonna take that as a no. Um, okay, so um, uh, after that, we have Abby German and Justin Dressler, 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 um, for the Police Review Committee. I think I saw Abby on here. Oh, and Justin is on as well. Um, would either of you like to, um, actually it'd be great if you would, uh, introduce yourselves to the council and um, tell us about your interest in this committee. And I see uh, Justin uh, has got his hand raised. Uh, go ahead, Justin. Hey, everybody. Justin Dreschler. Um, so I had originally applied for this committee the first time through. I um, This is something of great interest to me. I was a public defender in Boston, uh, straight out of law school for about five years. And uh, in the downtown Boston office, I spent most of my time representing people in, I would say, anything from very, very low level crimes like trespassing to, you know, more serious um, violent assault type things, things that we would all consider, for, I would say, relatively serious. Um, the that I left, uh, the primary reason for leaving was to try to pursue more civil rights litigation, like 1983 lawsuits against, in some cases, police officers, in cases of police brutality or discrimination cases, things along those lines. But I remained in large part a public defender in Massachusetts as a private contractor. My family and I moved to Montpelier a few years ago. We love it here. Uh, I'm still working in Boston, but I'm trying to get more involved in the community as I know now that this is gonna be our long-term home. And that's it. Great, thank you. Um, any questions for Justin? Okay, uh, and Abby, go ahead. Hello, Council. Uh, my name is Abby German. My pronouns are they, them, and I live in Montpelier, Vermont. Um, I, too, applied for this position on the Police Review Committee um, back in the first round, um, and I was pretty disappointed to see that all of the um, people that were appointed were older and white and it just seemed like a sort of monolithic representation of our town um as a queer person and as a younger person i'm 24 years old i think that both of those um identities would really add to uh the diversity of the council i've been working in food justice and housing justice for the past year and a half um, and i hope to bring that perspective to the police review committee 
I've also lived in Montpelier my whole life, um, so have a a pretty deep understanding of the town. Great, thank you. Um, any questions for Abby? <clears throat> Uh, okay. Um, Abby, I, I do have a question for you. I just want to um, put it out there. Last time you were very clear about your um, thoughts about uh, the police and, you know, appreciate hearing uh, that from you. This, uh, this committee, since it is, you know, looking at um, making recommendations for the, for the police, um, is, is, uh, I'm, I think one of the things that we hope for with this uh, committee is that, um, the, that people will be uh, objective and, um, you know, be able to, to put aside any uh, preconceived notions they may, may have to look at the data um, for this. And so not, not going to assume that, um, you know, any one conclusion is, is right or wrong at this point, but is that something you feel like uh, you can do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my work is definitely... Um informed by abolitionists that have come before me, but I am definitely able to look at data objectively without my personal opinion, um, like getting in the way of numbers. Okay. Great. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to, to, uh, check in about that. Um, um, just, you know, before we, uh, go into, um, you know, appointments. So thank you. Um, uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, not a question for either of the candidates, but um, overall, how, how many positions on the police review committee are we looking to fill tonight? Um, and I, my memory, if memory serves me correctly, we had actually asked, I think, the police review committee to to think about how many additional uh, positions they wanted and have we received any sort of response to that. So I, I did check in with the uh, police review committee and uh, so b and both of these folks have uh, been uh, recommended by them. And then adding to is within the parameters of our original um, numbers that we set out for this group. Okay. So Does that help? Is, yeah, I'm just. I was wondering if if, if this was an uh, an and situation or an either or situation or a at our discretion kind of situation. I mean, obviously everything's at our discretion uh, with appointments, but just wondering what what as opposed to like the DRB that has a set number. Um, I just wanted to understand sort of where what type of selection we were making an analysis. Thanks. Yep, yeah. uh, Jack, go ahead. Or as as one of the members of the commission, I, I would say that uh, as we were discussing it, we were not seeing this as a choice between one of these two candidates that we would be comfortable with the the council considering both candidates, and we felt that uh, we would want to get people on <clears throat> kind of at this early stage because if we if we wait too much longer you know people are going to be behind they're not going to have the committee's not going to have the benefit of their input for however much longer the delay is and so that was why we wanted to get it on for tonight's meeting great thank you uh michael go ahead I, I just to, to follow up on what Jack said and to answer very directly what Dan uh, Dan's question. Um, I think I can say with some confidence for the committee that we see these as the last two uh, re recommendations for uh, for board. Um, because as Jack pointed out, if we if we continue adding people, we won't really be able. We we I think we agreed that we really wouldn't be able to bring everybody up to speed in time to finish our work, as we see it now, uh, which is the end of June, which is when our committee we we think that's the end of the lifetime of the committee as it was uh, as it was created. So I don't think that. Uh, you can anticipate seeing more recommendations for the board from us. I can't promise that. I'm not the chair of the of the committee, but I think that that was at the center of our conversation. And Jack may want to um, 
confirm or dispute that, but that's anyway, that's what that's the way I see it. Thank you. I agree, I agree with that. And Lauren, Thank you. Uh, well, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, that I I agree. Um, only thing I wanted to note as well, we have talked about um, we have reached out to other community members that represent other perspectives and lived experiences that are not represented on the committee right now. And we've talked about um, potentially doing a more informal advisory council to bring in different perspectives in different ways and are talking a lot about public outreach and engagement. So even though I, you know, this, this is the set of folks that at least the committee is recommending to council right now, um, just to be clear to, to folks um, that the goal and expectation is to engage um, a variety of people in different, in different capacities and ways and have um, had some good initial outreach in that vein. Great, thank you. That seems really healthy. <laughs> um, all right, so we're gonna, are there any other um, um, questions at this point, comments? Um, okay, um, so uh, the other appointment uh, is to the um, Housing Authority and Eric uh, Schuthis, I, don't, um, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, is Schultheis, thank you. Um, yeah. Is Eric here? Okay, I do not see Eric. Um, okay, so. So from here, that, that those are all the, uh, Jack, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, pursuant to 1BSA section 313A3, I move to go into executive session to consider the appointment of a public officer. Yep. <laughs> and we have a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so we, uh, the council, are going to hop off of this call, but this line will stay open. Um, so we will return to this um, shortly. Okay, so we are out of uh, executive session. And is there a motion regarding appointments? Uh, yes, there is. I'd like to make a motion that we appoint Kate McCann and Christian Mayer to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee that we appoint Abby German and Justin Dressler to the Police Review Committee, and that we appoint Eric Schultes to the Housing Authority Committee. I'll second it. I think Anne may be frozen again. Motion and a second. Oh no! Oh no! Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you? Uh, okay. Okay. Great. Okay. All in, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, who stepped up for uh, those appointments, and um, thanks in advance for your work. Um, all right. So we are going to move on uh, in the agenda. And I, in all of my technical difficulties, I am not sure which item is next. Um, so um, yeah, somebody help, help me out. Which What item is up next? The Above and Beyond. What's that? The Above and Beyond Awards. Above and beyond. Awesome. This this bill Go used to do those. I, well, I'm going to hand this one off to Cameron, um, but if she doesn't mind, I didn't tell her I was going to, but she's probably more prepared on this than I am. But we had two this month because we missed last month. So we have two wonderful winners. We're happy to tell you about them. Thank you, Bill. Um, so yes, we're a little behind. So this is for November and December from last year and we're all caught up, caught up now and we'll start doing January's next month. So we have two folks this month. We have um, Jacqueline Hutton-Moser from our Parks Department 
Um, she's really been the driving force behind creating our Feast Farm program um, in the challenging COVID-19 environment. Uh, she's created a community farm that's growing food to support our um, home food delivery program through the Senior Center. And she's really been working through all of these quarantine days. She's been getting grants for it on her own. She's raised over $7,000 to support this project and the food's going to a really great cause and really supporting our community. And then we also have Mike Potter, our DPW Equipment Division Supervisor. He's really been the sole person supporting our DPW department's equipment maintenance and repair. Um, since um, the beginning of the year, really, he's been working really tirelessly to prepare and maintain DPW's equipment for the winter season. And um, his nomination forms really noted that um, the equipment that he maintains is the ones that make it possible for us to clear the roads and keep the roads in our environment safe for folks. So we really want to thank both Jack and Mike for their commitment and dedication and their service to the city and our residents of the city. So thank you to them both. I just want to throw in there about both of them are very well uh, deserving of this, but with Mike in particular, uh, not, not Jack isn't, but um, we normally have a second mechanic who's been out, so Mike's been doing really all the mechanic for uh, himself for quite quite a time. And you know, certainly in winter season, that's a lot. We are hiring a second one now, but um, so he's really been super dedicated and also shouldering a double load. So both very well deserved award winners. I would just like to apologize to Jacqueline and Mike that we can't make a big loud applause but I hope they feel our appreciation. It's awesome. Well, we did use the emojis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anne, you want to go to the community fund? Um, yes, that'd be great. Cameron, Cameron, can you see who's here? Uh, there's Christine. Please. Uh, I think there's quite a few folks here to present. Well, it'd be helpful, Cameron, if you just call on them so you can see everybody. fabulous employees. Oh, thanks, Anne. All right, I think Christine is here to speak. Um, and Amy, are you all giving a presentation? So Judy and Christopher as well? Just Christine on behalf of all of us. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Okay, well, I'll jump in. Um, thank you so much for having us. Um, we are cognizant that you have a packed agenda tonight, and we're really grateful to you for fitting us in. Um, so um, this is the Montpelier Community Fund Board. We usually come to you every year at this time and share recommendations with you. And so we're doing that again tonight and also um, hoping to share not only some recommendations, but also stories with you. Um, so to facilitate that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and um, I have permission to do that. now. OK, super. Thank you so much. Um, Super. All right. Um, so the Montpelier Community Fund, um, I want to introduce um, our other board members who are with us tonight. Um, if you all can give a wave. So Amy Cunningham is here, Christopher Kaufman Ilstrup, Michael Sherman, and Judy Sturmer. Um, and so we are the five member board of the Montpelier Community Fund. Um, 
Um, like I said, we want to present recommendations, but also create some context for you tonight and just do a little history review of, um, to just revisit who we are, why we're here, and what is this work that we are doing. So to do that, I wanted to just take us down on a little walk down memory lane, if you would indulge me. This is um, the city ballot from 2009. We can see there's 25 articles on here. Um, you can probably all remember going through these long ballots. You can probably remember signing petitions for nonprofits to get onto the ballot, right? I'm seeing a lot of smiling faces. So this is a familiar sight to us. It's in our not so distant memory. Um, the city council decided that um, this was not the most efficient way to allocate funding to organizations doing important services in our community. And so city council in 2012 designed a solution to this challenge by creating the Montpelier Community Fund. Um, so there's three important pieces to keep in mind about the community fund. One is um, we are a five member board and our job is to do due diligence on behalf of the city to allocate these precious taxpayer dollars. We ensure match with mission um, and we hold grantees accountable. Um, the city council in 2012, when they created the community fund board, created our board with a very broad charge. And so we can see that in number two, our criteria are the extent to which the grant will benefit Montpelier, its residents and the public good by effectively addressing basic human needs um, or by enhancing the quality, vitality and sustainability of life in Montpelier. So obviously there's a lot that fits into that. Believe it or not, we still get applications from organizations that don't fit into those criteria. Um, and then finally, in terms of the community fund board structure, one of the really smart things that the city council did in designing the community fund is to say that if applicants apply to the community fund, those applicants may not also petition to be placed on the ballot. Um, and that maneuver saves our ballots and our citizens from going through um, the dozens and dozens of applications that we see every year and also um, ensures a level of, um, of, of accountability. Um, so let's talk about um, briefly just our process for folks who might be a little bit less familiar with the Community Fund Board. Um, what um, our process is, is that we will typically um, start our work um, by meeting um, in the late summer or early fall. We review the application and guidelines. We have worked hard to um, make sure that those applications and guidelines are as streamlined as possible and accessible as possible for grantees. We have a page on the city website. Um, I wanna pause and give a shout out to Mary Smith for her incredible level of support this past year. Thank you so much, Mary. You made our work possible. Um, and then we release guidelines and applications and promote them like crazy. Hopefully you saw our social media posts, you saw our posts on Front Porch Forum, advertising the Community Fund Board to make sure that anybody who's providing important services in Montpelier knows about this as a source of funding. Um, every one of our five board members reads every application. Um, applications usually are 10 to 20 pages um, and then we meet for uh, about a half a day in December to make final recommendations. And then this tonight is when we bring you that final slate of recommendations for you to vote up or down as a group. Um, so that is our process. This year, our applications um, total $130,150. There are four, 34 grants in total. Um, you have those grants um, as part of your city council packet. So you have um, our minutes with the list of all of the grant recommendations that are included in your packet. Um, I just want to note that um, in comparison to past years, um, the percentage 
of human services grants is increasing. Last year, it was 35%. This year, it was 50%. I think the phone call about the dire circumstances of the gentleman who did not have shelter tonight in the beginning of the meeting helps to probably make that shift make sense for everybody. Um, and then we can see arts and humanities, education, and environment also make up really important totals for this um, fund as well. So in past years, um, we stopped here. And what I wanted to do this year, and again, we're gonna be cognizant of your time, is to also share some stories with you because what we know from reading these applications and reports is that every single one of these 34 applicants has an incredibly compelling story of impact to share with you. Um, and you don't get to hear it, we get to hear it, but you don't. And we wanna give you some highlights. Um, I shouldn't even use the word highlights, it suggests that some grants are better than other. We wanna give you, share some vignettes with you. Um, so first of all, to do that, we're gonna do a deep dive into that human services wedge of that pie, that 50%, with a little focus on food security. The background here to consider is that due to the pandemic, food security in the state of Vermont has increased 30% in the last year to the point that now one in four Vermonters don't have reliable access to affordable, nutritious food. So food security is something that we as a community need to be cognizant of. And thankfully, we have some amazing organizations in the city that we are supporting through the Montpelier Community Fund who are working on this issue. So Community Harvest of Central Vermont. Maybe some of you have been out on gleans with this amazing group. I know my family has. This organization is a gleaning organization, and that means that they organize dozens and dozens of volunteers every year to harvest usable produce that is left over at local farms. They work with 40 local farms, and this is an organization that rose to the challenge of 2020 by almost doubling the amount of food that they harvested and then distributed in our community. Um, so much food it accounted for over 100,000 meals. I also really want to note that um, over 3,000 Montpelier residents ate that food. Over 3,000, almost, I mean, with our, we're a community of 7,400 people, almost half of our community benefited from glean food from the Community Harvest of Central Vermont that the M Montpelier Community Fund Board helped to support. Another food security organization is Just Basics. Um, and you know, probably most people are familiar with Just Basics. It's our, our food shelf in Trinity Methodist Church. For years, this is a food shelf that had about 200 people um, a month coming in. And then two years ago, prior to COVID, their visits started increasing exponentially. They went up to 600 people per month coming in prior to COVID and COVID has increased the number of people they are serving by 17%. Again, this is another organization that has shifted and been rising to the challenge of COVID. They're providing online ordering to help people stay safe during the pandemic since they can't offer a sort of grocery shopping experience. And again, another, another organization with incredible community support in the form of 60 people who volunteer to keep that food shelf going. So as important as it is to feed our bellies, um, it's also incredibly important to feed our heart and soul through the arts and humanities, and especially now than, uh, more so than ever during this time of um, national challenges. One of the organizations that does that is the Vermont Humanities Council. Um, the Humanities Council seeks to engage all Vermonters in a world of ideas, foster a culture of thoughtfulness, and inspire a lifelong love of reading and learning. I had to read their mission out loud because, I mean, I think that there has not been a time um, ever before where the need for that sort of work has been more apparent. Um, so the Humanities Council 
um, presents hundreds and hundreds of events every year, most of which are free. What the community fund specifically supports are the first Wednesday's lecture series. Um, and so these are free lectures. They formerly happened at Kellogg Hubbard. Now, because of COVID, they're happening on Zoom, which is amazing because now you can go to the Vermont Humanities website and you can go to any one of their first Wednesdays series around the whole state. So there's 80 happening this year on incredible topics, women's suffrage, Duke Ellington, poetry, um, the storytelling of the Nalhegan Abenakis. So, I mean, this is the sort of content that we need right now to keep our minds and our souls healthy as well as our bodies during COVID. And this is part of what we are hoping to support. Another arts organization is um, the T.W. Wood Art Gallery. Now, again, this is a well-known organization in town, but um, I want to pause just to note and have us fully appreciate um, how incredible it is that in, in a town of our size, that we have a community arts organization with a large permanent collection of incredibly important artwork from the first part of the century, as well as galleries for new contemporary artwork. And this is artwork that's not just stuffed into their vaults and galleries, they are getting it out in the community. They are placing this artwork at the state house and at the hospital. They're encouraging people to interact with their artwork everywhere, just the way that T.W. Wood is in, inviting people to interact with them through classes and camps and poetry readings with an incredible commitment to making their programming accessible to everyone. Um, they have a really strong emphasis on scholarships to make sure that if you wanna send your kid to art camp, if you wanna send your kid to their after school programs, you can do it um, regardless. Um, so let's move on and think a little bit as well about the importance in our community of also making sure that every Montpelierite is able to access this community that we all know and love and be a part of it. One of the organizations that does that is the Central Vermont Council on Aging. Um, this is an organization I confess I did not know a lot about before I became involved with the Montpelier Community Fund Board. Um, they started a whopping 362 Montpelier residents this past year with a whole suite of services, some of which you see here. Um, they're ensuring that people get meals. They're ensuring that people can access Medicare. And again, this is an organization that has shifted in, in a remarkably flexible way in response to COVID. Um, you know, we all feel, I will speak for myself and guess that others feel the same way, isolated as a result of our lack of ability to connect to others. Central Vermont Community, or Central Vermont uh, Council on Aging understands that our elders are especially vulnerable to feeling isolated. So they have recruited and trained an entire suite of volunteers whose job it is, is to call and check in on our seniors, to check in and say, what do you need? What can I offer you? They even have a full-time staff person now who helps seniors access technology to participate in online events. Um, and if that is not responsive to COVID, I don't, I don't know what is. One more organization that we wanna share with you um, and that is the Vermont Center for Independent Living. Um, the Vermont Center for Independent Living describes themselves as people with disabilities working together for dignity, independence, and civil rights. This is an organization that makes it possible for people with disabilities to fully engage in our community. They are offering support by peers, by peers with disabilities, offering support to peers with disabilities to um, you know, more fully engage in life in the community. They are offering modifications to your home if you need a wheelchair ramp suddenly. 
They're ensuring that Meals on Wheels gets to people with disabilities as well as to our seniors. Um, they even offer technical assistance to business owners. So our beloved downtown retailers could call the Vermont Center for Independent Living and get help on figuring out how to make their businesses more accessible to people with disabilities. Um, so this is just a small, small selection of the 34 organizations that we are putting forth to you as part of a slate tonight of um, grantees from the Montpelier Community Fund Board. Um, and we are grateful for your time on the agenda tonight and grateful for you being willing to take a little tour of grantees with us. And we just wanna leave the door open and say that we um, are so, would be so uh, open to engaging in further conversation with the city council about um, how to focus this incredibly important taxpayer monies on the services that we need in the city um, or about the processes that the city uses to fund important services in our community. So leave it there um, and turn it back over to you for questions and discussion. Great, thank you. Um, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, unsharing your screen, then yes. that will allow me yes. to see everyone. Awesome. Um, Great, thank you. That was so heartening <laughs> and uh, <laughs> delightful. Um, you know, we we know we have a lot of um, fantastic organizations that we we know are funded through the community fund, but it really is um, delightful to hear those, um, like how it's uh, at least a few examples anyway of how that money is actually being spent. Um, makes me really uh, proud of <laughs> of this this fund and and all of your work. It's so grateful for um, the time that you all spend going through those applications and and vetting them and making sure that people in Montpelier are spending their tax dollars not just wisely but to to help um, our our own community effectively. Um, so that is uh, really wonderful. Um, other comments or questions? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I want to echo this and I just want to say, I mean, I've been on a lot of nonprofit boards and this is one of the best um, presentations I think I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, um, we're lucky to have a dedicated um, group of people, Christine that you lead, Amy and Judy and Christopher and Michael. Um, we're really lucky to have that because I think you do a lot of the important work of making sure that you know, it isn't a race to the ballot like it was before and who can get the necessary signatures and just sort of put on what, what you know, was either on before people were used to voting for or what may come off as sort of popular, but what's really needed. And I really appreciate the work and thoughtfulness you guys have put into this. And like I said, I mean, it's really heartening to hear these stories. It's also somewhat depressing to hear you know, some of the rise of food insecurity and uh, human services that are you, you're addressing and picking up. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, the only question I have is really, you know, as you've seen in these past two years where there's been this growth and this shift from, uh, you know, human services to eating, you know, going from 35% to 50%, do you see that increasing uh, over the next couple of years? Um, and is this something that we should be thinking about and preparing for as a city um, in addressing? Uh, I'll jump in, but I um, also, you know, certainly turn to all my colleagues on the board um, to add their thoughts as well. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, as you know, my answer is going to be informed both by my experience with the Montpelier Community Fund Board, but also my work as a philanthropic advisor. I literally spent time on the phone today or on Zooms with five different food shelves across the state. Um, so I think that, yes, the demand is absolutely going to increase. Um, I think that the only reason that organizations are not asking for more money right now is that there's been this tradition of very, very small grants. And so that's where the expectations are set. Um, if there was more funding available, there are organizations that could use it really well tomorrow. 
Um, so, you know, in general, both in Montpelier um, as well um, as, you know, across the state, I think that we're going to see needs increasing for years to come. I mean, it, it took 10 years for us, you know, after the Great Recession, um, for us to fully recover the jobs and the economy that we had pre-Great Recession. And the same thing's going to exist, except, you know, the federal funding that has kept us afloat is not going to last for 10 years, right? So at some point, the federal funding is going to go away. It's going to be up, up to us as community members to fully support the services that are so critical for our neighbors. So I'm sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but the answer is definitely yes. And I certainly yield to any of my colleagues who want to share thoughts as well. Thank you. Um, other thoughts or questions? Uh, Jay, go ahead. Christopher, did you want to add something? I'm sorry, I thought you put your hand up. You were just scratching your head. Okay, that's <laughs> okay. Good. Um, yeah, I just want to echo Dan um, and Anne's comments and uh, thank Christine and and all all of for all and all of you, all the board for your work. Um, for all the qualifying organizations, I wish we could fund them all at 150% of what they asked for, that's for sure. Um, just one, one question that I had just to help my understanding was, I did notice in the list that there are a lot of statewide organizations um, that apply. And there were um, some that were fully funded and there were some that were called out for not necessarily, not called out, that, maybe that's too tough, but, but were, in your notes would acknowledge that they didn't necessarily connect to the Montpelier community enough. And so I'm just curious how you all quantify that. I think you gave a great example with the Humanities Council about the lecture series and how it comes right to Montpelier. I just want to understand how um, you all sort of make those decisions for organizations that are not just Montpelier focused. Yeah, that's a really good question, Jay. And I'm glad you that you asked that. Um, so, in our application, we ask specific, we ask you know broadly about mission, you know the organization programs, but then we also ask specifically about activities in Montpelier and the number of Montpelierites served. So we ask about the total number of people an organization might serve, but then of that total, we're very interested in knowing how many people specifically in Montpelier are going to be served. And you're right, we, that's a piece that, of course, we take really seriously. There are statewide organizations who manage to also, as you described, be intensely local and offer very appropriate locally specific activities. You know, there are some statewide organizations that um, offer programs with a broader brushstroke. Right, and sometimes those are not, we feel that they are not as appropriate for the city of Montpelier. So, um, you know, that's uh, definitely a filter that we use rigorously. Michael um, has his hand up. Yeah, Michael, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to add that one of the other questions that we have on the application is, um, the extent to which any one organization interacts and, and works with and cooperates with other similar other organizations doing similar work, it, which allows us really to assess sort of their you know their uh, understanding of where they fit in our in the community and and in this community of of organizations that are providing services and and that is one of the that is one of the things we do consider um, and tr and try to incorporate into into our our thinking and, and, and award making. Great, thank you. Any other comments or, or questions? Okay, um, well, so again, um, thank you uh, for that presentation. That was really, that was very helpful. Um, I, actually, I do have one further question. Um, is the timeline that you all are working on now, does that work for you all? Uh, that is a really good question. I will say, honestly, the timeline is really awkward. Um, okay. And here's, here's why. I'm not sure that there's anything to be done about it, though, truly, because, you know, we have applicants who 
are putting their applications together, let's say um, in October for a November deadline. So let's look at this past year. Um, they're, you know, they're putting an application in in November of 2020. And then they will hear about recommendations. Um, they'll wait until town meeting day to find out whether or not the budget passed and they're funded. And then in um, July or August, July, August, um, they will be funded. So, you know, they're going from November to July. I'm sorry, July? Beginning of the fiscal year. July. Um, yeah, July. Yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's an extremely prolonged period. Um, you know, I'm not sure there's anything that we can do about that, I, I, you know, but, you know, anyway, in response to your question, the timing is awkward and we just try, we actually just recommitted as a board to putting together materials uh, and a, a list of FAQs so to, as to explain that timeline to grantees and and make the process a little bit less mysterious for them, um, you know, I, I I don't think that there's much that we can do to address it, but we'll just help to you know hopefully we'll make the process a little bit easier as we keep working to streamline things. The other point, okay. if I may, Mayor, um, um, is that go ahead, Donna. They're giving a report on data of the completed year. They're in the middle of one year and they won't get paid. Actually, the checks don't come until August. So it's a very strange timeline. And I don't know what you do with it, but it's very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other comments or questions? OK. Um, I'm afraid I'm I'm getting a little glitchy here, so I apologize. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And um, I don't think we need to approve this separately. Am I correct about that? It's, um, so we already included it in the um, budget. Well, you include the total funding. You usually approve the award. Is awards. that correct? Yes. Oh, we okay. Got usually you. Usually approve what they've given us. Uh, Bill, I had Got a question. You. In the actual worksheet, I thought we had one thousand one one thirty one, and she put on her chart one three zero. <clears throat> She's saving us money. That's that's our Christine. <laughs> Steward of the public funds. It is one thirty. We want that eight hundred and fifty dollars back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I make a motion that we ex accept the recommendations of awards as presented by the MCF committee. Okay. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. okay, and opposed? Okay, all right. Thank you again um, for all your work. So appreciate it. Um, all right, so next up is the uh, audit. And I am assuming that the folks um, from the audit are here. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to to them. So I'm going to touch things off here and just provide a quick introduction. Okay. I um, don't have a presentation prepared. Um, the summary memo um, just detailing kind of a high level of um, kind of the puts and takes of where we ended up um, is provided online. Um, hopefully you get a chance to take a look at it. Um, and I'm happy to take questions on it um, if needed. But without further ado, um, on the call tonight, um, we've got myself, um, our senior staff accountant, um, and then you've got members from our auditors forum, um, Ron Smith and Miranda McDonald. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of tee things up here and then they're gonna take over and um, provide more detail and then take questions. 
Um, so just uh, we engaged um, RHR Smith in 2019. So this is our second audit with them um, and things have gone really, really well. Uh, we're really pleased with the outcome. Um, you know, we ended the year um, with a, a positive to the general fund of $4,130, which is kind of a big deal because following the balancing ball around, um, we're actually to the good. Um, and that, you know, is through a lot of effort, you know, city staff, you know, putting in um, the work and conserving resources. So our plan's working, um, so that's, that's good. Um, the other thing that, you know, the audit does give us is, um, a single audit um, for federal funding that exceeds $750,000. Um, there's also a tip report that's included. Um, and so to that end, we had an unmodified opinion over last year's opinion, which means we've got a clean audit and um, that makes me pretty happy. Um, so happy to share that. And then um, moving on just to kind of the discussion for tonight and we'll, we'll have um, Ron and Miranda, you know, touch off here, but what I want to kind of review is just sort of some of the results within the funds, um, government proprietary, um, our net position and some of our proprietary funds, because well, you know, it's good news in 20 that we're coming in where we are, we do have some work to do. And I just really want to underscore that so that then we can kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and then, you know, we also want to really highlight the impacts of our infrastructure upgrades. Um, and what that's doing to our proprietary funds. So um, we are currently working with Public Works to get the utility budgets together and those will be coming forward in February. Um, we're also working on updating the master plan. So things are in the works um, and this you know, audit is just kind of helping us inform what's next. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there um, and have Ron and Miranda take over. I wanna know how to do the emojis. <laughs> Miranda, go ahead. We'll have a lesson on that. Um, so I want to say it, 20 was, it's been a hard year and it's been a hard year for everybody. Um, I will say the transition, especially with Kelly coming on, with Heather coming on, and then, you know, three months later, COVID hitting. So that wasn't easy. And the fact that y'all ended up positive by $4,000 you need to embrace that. Um, I think that's that's uh, that's a lot of communication. That's a lot of talking and planning. And I think that is is uh, you know that's 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 good. And um, that means well, you know what that means. Um, that is something though that you need to talk about also going into twenty one. As Remember, well. she's, from, she's from Southern Vermont down in Texas, you guys, so forgive her there. She's stuttering a little bit. I am. Um, you know, with that $4,000, it contributes to your overall fund balance um, of just a little under $2 million. Um, so when you look at it, you have about a $14 million expenditure budget um, for FY20. So that's roughly about... 30 days, 30, 45 days worth of expenditures, which is good-ish. Um, we like to see it a little higher, but um, right now with what the world is going through, I think um, it's, uh, it's positive, it's a positive note. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll hop in here. You, usually the standards say 30, 60, 90 days of your operating budget. So in Montpelier terms, a million, two million, three million. And as Miranda said, you know, you landed on right around uh, 45 days, you know, of your of your fund balance and unrestricted is the big one. And, and I think that was a little north of a million four. So I think that that's great. And the fact that you landed this plane, you know, um, uh, with all the, the, the adversity that you guys uh, felt in last year, I think is remarkable. Um, so with that, I think um, the next topic is the enterprise funds, um, which is your water, your sewer, um, parking and, and uh, district heat. Um, water and sewer being your largest funds. Um, 
you know, water and sewer, you actually had a net increase in your fund, fund balance. So you did put money into that, but I do think a large part of that was you delayed projects. Um, you know, you didn't know what was happening in the world. And I think um, a lot of that was delayed projects going into the last three months of the fiscal year. Um, parking and district heat both had um, a, um, you overexpended, so you had a decrease um, in that position um, with that. So that is something that probably should be looked at. Um, but also you, you've delayed some projects in your enterprise funds, um, but you still have, you know, you've still invested heavily in your capital assets. Um, you also have debt in your capital asset or debt associated with some of those capital assets in your enterprise funds. Um, so when you look at your net position, especially in the sewer fund, um, there's a deficit balance in your sewer fund and your parking fund and district heat. So, um, that's something that, um, as you as you plan your budgets, as you look at your master plan, and I know Kelly, um, we've had these conversations that that as you are building your budgets and as you're looking at your master plans, and you know we are in 21 in COVID, but these projects can't be put on hold forever. Um, but it is something that you are going to have to address um, and look and look for and 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 really. Um, understand um, what it's going to take to to maintain um, the infrastructure. Yeah, and I, and I think it's fair to say you all, what, what equity that you guys have in your utilities and these enterprise funds, it's all tied up in your infrastructure. There is really not a lot of liquid there. And I think you're going to face some big challenges in the very near future, you know, with all the projects that you got going on, all the delays that you had, all the future forthcoming projects, reviewing this master plan that you have, there's going to have to be a lot of thought that's going to get put into, you know, get put into this master plan. And, 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 and I'm hoping back in 2008, what happened then with these era and stimulus monies back then, that the governments are going to start seeing a lot of money in the next third, fourth, and fifth stimulus packages, you know, here. And, uh, and I think Montpelier could be a great benefit of, uh, of that when that happens. I wanted to ask Miranda a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You labeled the page differently, but your numbers match the ones on statement B, where you have those water, sewer, parking, and district heat. Um, what did you call this? As you were talking, you called it something else. This is uh, the enterprise funds. Enterprise fund. Okay. Yeah, statement G. Yep. Well, this is actually um, statement B that I'm looking at, so I should so be. Statement B um, is a consolidation of all um, operating, but if you go further into the document, um, okay. statement C is your fund financial. So when I looked at the general fund, that's usually what I look at is statement C. Um, that's going to show what the fund balance, the 1.8, um, or 1.9 mm -hmm. million. And then if you go further down into uh, statement E. Yes. And then statement G is what I was looking at for the inter proprietary funds, um, but they're, they're enterprise funds. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It helps me to correlate the documents with you. Yes. Sorry about that. Are there any other questions? Um, I don't have a question. I am just uh, thrilled that we had a clean audit, unmodified. And um, I think that speaks well of our uh, financial team and I'm so grateful for all of their work. Um, I also was think it's worth uh, saying out loud that, you know, I certainly hear you on the, um, on the fund balance 
uh, amount, you know, whether it's, you know, 30, 60 or 90 days worth of fund balance. And, and, you know, it, it seems to me that, that, um, you know, as we consider what we put our money towards, uh, when we hope things turn out to be better than we expect in this budget, um, that uh, some of it, I think, ought to go towards um, building up, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, building up our unassigned fund balance um, so that we have um, some resiliency for when when times may be hard again. Um, so that's, um, yeah, your point is well taken. <laughs> Um, other thoughts or comments, questions? Uh, Bill. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd just like to offer a couple comments. First of all, thanks to the auditing team for the report and the hard work that, that you did. It's been great working with you. Um, one of the nice things about when we do the audit is we get to recognize um, at least one person that we don't normally see. So Heather Graves is with us today. She's the our head of our, you know, our top accountant and doesn't come to many council meetings, but really does all the, the work that, that keeps us together. And, and as um, Ron and Miranda said, uh, we had, you know, Ruth retired, Todd re left. Uh, we didn't backfill positions. So Kelly and Heather and their team were really doing this short staffed and Heather really had to step up in that chief role. So not only did we, were we able to pull off a clean audit, but doing it under some pretty tough situations throwing a pandemic on top of it. And uh, so we're really proud of both of them and the whole finance department, but I really want to give a shout out to Heather because we don't get to get to thank her publicly enough. So. Um. Thank you. Well said. Um, Madam Mayor, can I make a comment? Um, you may, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, I just want to, uh, thank the presenters and uh, ask that you this this issue of the of the infrastructure, the repairs, the money coming our way, and our preparedness to act on that money and spend it wisely requires a whole lot of planning that that we're not that good at, or that demonstrably we're not that good at. So I'm I'm glad that they made the point. I think you'll hear it better from them than from me, but. If we, this is going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity to use stimulus money and we are we, we are still not yet acknowledging the the depth of the overdue and deferred maintenance on our, our sidewalks and on our curbs and on our storefronts and, and streets and and water systems. So I just I just want to um, commend that they brought that up and uh, ask y'all to find a way to discuss this in a real in a meeting as soon as soon as possible and uh, get started on it. Thanks. And I would Thank offer you. that we'd be more than uh, uh, embracing and extending our hand to participate in that because I think come March or April you guys will be armed with better information you know on what uh, what relief is going to look like. Fair enough. Okay, any other comments or questions on the audit? Okay. All right, well, thank you again um, for all of your work and thank you uh, to our, our financial crew for all of their work as well. Um, all right, so I think we are ready to uh, move on then uh, to the um, second hearing of uh, the sure. budget. Um, yes. We should vote to accept the audit. Oh, thank you. Good call. Okay. Um, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the audit as presented. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And uh, opposed? <laughs> Okay, all right, so the motion passes. All right, thank you again. Everybody be safe and well. You, you too. too. Thanks. Okay, all right. So now we are on to um, the uh, second uh, public hearing on the budget, FY22 budget. Um, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing before I forget to do that. Um, and I, if I am not mistaken, I believe. Um, Bill has some um, comments um, or uh, 
presentation to make. Um, so go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And and oh, sorry, let me just say one thing. We're going to hear from Bill, and then we'll go from there into public comment. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members, members of the public. Uh, as you know, this is the, the deadline night um, to put a final number on the ballot. And, and that final ballot is coming up later. Uh, I'm just gonna walk through a amended version of the, the um, presentation you saw last week. So hopefully my share screen will go a little easier than it did last week. Um, so here we are, look at that. All right, can people see that? Is that working? Yes. Great. Okay, well, I'll try to get through this. As you know, it's not terribly long. Uh, this is January 21st, our, our final budget hearing. As we are working on the FY22 budget. This means it runs from July 1 of this year to uh, June 30 of next year. So still almost the end of this budget is almost 18 months away. Always a challenge to, to look that far ahead. Um, we obviously, our struggles this year, we had a major budget gap due to COVID-19. We were hoping to implement our strategic plan uh, that the council had adopted to the extent possible with our financial resources the way they were. We made collectively the policy decision to uh, base this on a one year COVID-19 horizon, making the assumption that with a vaccine and other things that by the time we are doing this budget next year, we should be um, in a different uh, situation. We also did this with the recognition that residents and businesses uh, were hurt by COVID-19, not just the municipal government, and that they are facing their own financial stresses. The strategic plan priorities that we tried to incorporate in, uh, and we did put a summary in the initial budget book of how we thought we met at least some of these priorities, uh, were community prosperity, COVID-19 response, environmental stewardship, more housing, responsive and responsible government and sustainable infrastructure. Later on tonight, assuming we make it, you will be getting uh, the second quarter update on the strategic plan and how we're doing with those specific areas. So we started with a, a pretty uh, large gap in revenue. Um, our general fund was projected to be down about $520,000. This was through a combination of all sorts of general revenues that we receive. And our parking fund in particular is going to be down another 525,000. And uh, the, the question I was going to ask, so we, you know, isn't the parking fund uh, an independent fund? And it is, but several um, activities, uh, police, finance, DPW, many others are funded by the parking fund uh, because of the work is related. And normally portions of their budget are shown in the parking budget. And because those, those revenues had dried up. Um, some of those funds, over half a million of those funds, appeared in the general fund, helping to create uh, an even bigger budget gap of about a million dollars. We, in addition, we had, um, as fate would have it, in, in a COVID year and a revenue bad year, this uh, we had the rare once every 12 years, 27th pay period, which basically built in close to 4% um, on top of all of our personnel costs with, uh, with one 27th more uh, of the year. So that added added funds, plus we have steps and other costs of, of personnel. Uh, we recognize we've been under funding legal and needed to set something aside for that. And um, we are, as, as you know, we're about to embark on a reappraisal uh, and which costs in the neighborhood of $260,000 and we're going to start putting money in reserve for the next one in another 10 years uh, because that's actually what the state gives us money for. So all of that was about 400,000 making a total combined budget gap when we started working on this budget of uh, 1.44 million dollars. Obviously we've, we've had some budget challenges in the past but never anything like this. So in order to try to close that gap we left uh, six positions vacant throughout the budget. Uh, one police officer, one finance position, two rec positions, and two DPW positions. We also scaled back on our capital equipment plan and uh, realizing what a difficult decision that is based on the conversation we just had. We reduced some of our external community funding. 
And again, we just heard the report from the community fund and we heard a report earlier of, of homeless issues. So clearly those are, are areas that need funding. Cut back at operations funding and we have one less ballot item uh, this year, um, at least we did. Tonight we'll know for sure, I guess. Uh, so those were made aware we managed to cut about $1.2 million from the budget to try to close that gap. So what is, what's in the budget uh, that we can talk about? The current budget has less than a, less than a cent property tax increase, lower than a percent, just a little over half a percent increase, 0.6%. Um, we did include funding from Montpelier Alive. We included uh, funding for the equity project that the uh, Social Equity Justice Committee is working on. We included some operating funds for MEAC. Uh, the energy committee, the social worker for the public, for the police department, excuse me, is still in the budget. The library ballot item is in there. The central Vaughan home health and hospice uh, ballot in there, ballot item is included. And those personnel cost out reallocations that I just talked about from all the, the hit all these different departments that came from the, the parking fund back into the general fund. So again, as you saw, that was 500 and some odd thousand dollars of impact uh, to the budget. Um, and uh, through it all, we've tried to keep all our basic services that we provide residents and what they pay for intact so that they can get uh, the nuts and bolts of what they've come to expect. Some key budget items that, that we spend a lot of time talking on, uh, just so people can see this, uh, the first column is what was in the current budget. The, the middle column is what we adjusted this current budget to in order to uh, address the needs of the of, of the COVID crisis, and then the third column is what we're proposing in the budget for 2022. So the community fund, we've kept flat throughout throughout this at 131. The housing trust fund, we originally had 110,000 in the budget. We adjusted it to 60 in this current year and proposing 50 for next year. The Montpelier Development Corporation had 100,000 in, which was adjusted to 75,000, and we are proposing no funding for that uh, in this coming year. Homelessness Task Force, again, originally at 45,000, we dropped it to 22,500. Council restored it to the full 45 uh, for this coming year, recognizing the importance of that. Public Arts Fund was dropped, uh, again, originally appropriated at 20, dropped to 10 in the uh, current year and reduced to zero for this future year. On the other side of the spectrum, the community capital area neighborhoods had not received funding uh, in prior years, but was added uh, for 20,000 for this year. So you can see this funding area, originally we had a little over 400,000 in these, in these areas. Now we're just under 250,000. So one of the questions we've been asked a lot and has come up a lot is, is the police budget up 10.4%? And there, there seems to be uh, an understandable amount of confusion about that. So I'd like to walk us quickly through this. This is our budget in the general fund. So you can see the changes over the years. And if you notice, uh, first of all, the, the police operations and school resources, uh, school resource officer combined are what we consider the police department. And then in red is the dispatch operation, which is while connected to police department is not, um, has not been the source of, I think, some of the questions and controversy in the study committees and all that sort of thing. Um, so you'll see that was actually up 20.6%. So when you combine the two of them who are run by the Montpelier Police Department, that budget is, in fact, the general fund budget up is up by 10.4%. The police operations itself are only up by about 7%. But I'd also ask you to notice, if you look at the prior three years, you see, you know, fairly steady growth, obviously just some inflationary growth, and then a pretty large jump, $150,000 this year. Uh, and I think that's what people are objecting to. You see the similar thing in dispatch. So why is that? Why, why would we do this in a year where police are under question? And I think the answer is pretty simple. Um, we talked about these. So out of the 500 and some odd thousand dollars that uh, had been previously charged to the, the parking fund, $208,000 of that uh, actually had to do with uh, police and dispatch. Similarly, the cost of the 27th pay period for these two departments, uh, for this 
work combined is just over $100,000. So if you take a look, you see the combined total of the increase for this year is $312,000. And yet the combined uh, sort of impact of the parking fund and the general fund is $308,000. So it's a pretty direct uh, shift of where the money's coming from, not increases in money. So we'll take a look at that um, at police itself, since that's the area. So again, we take a look at the police department combined and we take out that, that 27th pay period. And then our, now we're at a sort of a more serviceable 3.4% increase, which is not that out of line with um, departments that we've seen in the years past. But again, $123,000 in that budget had, has come over from the parking fund. So if you actually netted that out, which, you know, is a, a kind of a simplistic way of putting it, but, you know, technically we're actually at a lower budget than we were last year for, for the police department. Now, I'm not going to make that claim, but I think it's important to look that, you know, this kind of this, you know, 200 some odd thousand dollars has of the, the 27th pay period in the personnel plan have sort of offset a $153,000 budget increase. So at the very least, the, the budget is, is even and, and compared to 21, it's possibly down a little bit. And how do I say that? How does, uh, Dan, can I just finish and then I'll- Yeah, take... no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so what does that actually look like? We take a look at the police department summary and we see that we actually have budgeted for one less officer. We've gone from 17 to 16. There's no new equipment in the budget at all. Uh, typically, the police department gets a new cruiser. They get things like more body shields, more uh, you know, various police-type equipment things, maybe radios, those types of things. Nothing. There is zero in the budget for, the, for police operations. The only equipment budget for the police department is a uh, dispatch console uh, that's been budgeted but not purchased. Um, that's it. And then we... Despite all that, despite these reductions, we continue to include our share of the social worker, uh, which um, had, um, which we added last year as, as a new innovative way to, to provide policing in the community. So I think it's pretty simplistic to say the police department is up 10.4%. When you look at it more closely, you can see that it, there's actually been a reduction in force, reduction in equipment funding uh, and that it's a pretty simple explanation of how those numbers work. And you have to split out police and dispatch to get the truer picture. Just moving on, uh, key budget numbers in the overall budget. Um, the general fund is reduced by two and a half percent from the prior year's approval. And we're asking for a small amount of new tax dollars because of the lost revenue. We are not planning any changes in the water and sewer and CSO benefit charges. For the average home, uh, for the municipal taxes, they'll see about a $16 tax increase. And compare this to uh, the, the uh, end of December C, uh, CPI, Consumer Pricing Index for our region, uh, was 1.4%. So we are about half of that. We did do a survey. We asked questions. I'll, I went through this last week, so I'll do this much more quickly. But we got um, 320 responses. 96% uh, of them were from uh, city residents. And they identified public works, infrastructure, uh, those types of things as their top priority. They also included police, uh, excuse me, fire, police, and parks uh, as their next um, priority. So I think trying to recognize that this is what our public says is important is the type of thing we tried to include in the budget. Finally, ask the questions, uh, would you support increasing taxes to uh, support the revenues to keep our current service levels? About 30% supported that, about 33% were neutral, and about 38% did not support that. Uh, so kind of split. Uh, and as you can see, the city council has worked very hard at not increasing the taxes substantially in order to provide the, the current service levels. So where are we in the schedule? Today is the final public hearing when we, the council needs to adopt a budget. 
In February, we'll begin discussions of the utility budgets, which are not ballot items, so we have less of a time crunch on those. And town meeting voting is on March 2nd, uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Early voting will start in mid-February, and I'm sure the city clerk will talk about this later, um, but it certainly looks like there will be mail-in voting and remote voting. So that's where we're at with the budget. I'm happy to answer any questions now. Uh, and if, some, if you want, I can leave this up or try to go back to slides. Otherwise, I'll just answer questions. Um, thanks, Bill. It is, it's easier for me anyway to call on folks if you can stop sharing your screen so that I can Happy to do that. Um, see everybody. And if we need to go back, that is okay. Um, so I did see uh, a hand um, from Dan. Uh, uh, and so, uh, but uh, to any uh, member of the public who'd like to make a comment, um, now is an okay time. You can um, raise your um hand or um, just wave at us or something and we'll we'll call on you in a minute but um, Dan go ahead thanks <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure I understood with the police numbers bill um, you're, you're really citing to two sources um, one of which seems to be an increase because of the 27th pay period so there's a chunk of money that just because of the quirk of the calendar gets added for payroll purposes um that's throughout, all, that's throughout the entire budget no, that's right okay. right and that's every every city employee that's on a salary right um and then and then the other it seems to be um the fact that we're moving the fund some of the funding from the parking fund over to the general fund so it's not that the funding's increasing it's just that rise represents the increase that comes out of the general fund because we're shifting from uh, funding sources is that that's exactly right um the way the way it worked and actually uh it, this going through this was a good exercise thing for kelly and i um because uh, we'll probably change the way we do this in the future um but we actually budgeted the expenses into the funds that they're charged from so say a police officer was 90 percent general fund and 10% parking fund. 90% of their pay would be in the general fund budget and 10% would show in the parking fund. Perhaps a better way to do it would put, put the 100% in the police budget with, a, with the revenue being transferred from the parking fund to the general fund to offset it. Um, I think that's probably a, a clearer, more transparent way of doing that. But it isn't the way we've done it since before I got here. Uh, and so what happened is then that $200,000 of of police and dispatch money expenses that had been chart being in the dis parking fund are now moving into the general fund. And to be clear, that also happens in public works because a lot of the maintenance of the parking um, structures, and uh, not structures, but uh, lots, you know, those kind of things is also um, picked up by public works. Finance has a huge amount of that because of, you know, processing parking tickets and all those kind of things. So, um, you know, like we said at the beginning, it was about 500 some odd thousand that came from the parking fund into the general fund this year, and about 200,000 of that was in police and dispatch. Well, that, that's actually anticipating one of my other questions. Are there other funds where we're seeing that, that same sort of percentage rise in part because they came out of the parking fund and now have to go into the general fund? Yeah, it's scattered throughout the budget. Police and finance are the, I mean, excuse me, police, public works, and finance are the biggest ones. Um, but then there's, you know, other things. And, and we did recognize that shortfall at the beginning as, you know, I think we, we gave you the heads up on that way back in November that that was going to be one of the major impacts on the general fund budget is making up for this transfer. Um, so, you know, some of it was already accommodated through in the whole, whole thing. Uh, and, and as was with police. But that said, if you look at the general fund budget, police and dispatch just this year to the lecture, they are up 10%, but the budgets themselves aren't. It's just where they're being paid from. Right. And so it's it's more reflective of their their funding sources than any additional dollars on the table, uh, apart from the the payroll um, quirk that's true of every part of the city. Correct. Correct. Um, so I did, and, and just sorry, just to maybe make bring back one, one of your points, just to be clear, there would there are other accounting methods that if you had done it that way 
this wouldn't even necessarily be recorded as an increase because of the, uh, you know, if, for example, if the police were, were expenses were simply booked to the police and the general fund, we well, wouldn't necessarily even capture this. Yeah, it would look differently um, a little bit on um, that hundred whatever. Well, I think it was for 200,000 of the combination police and dispatch. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the extra pay period would show up all the way through. Okay. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, all right, I see a hand from uh, Sarah Parker Gibbon, Gibbons and then uh, Lauren, go ahead. Um, hi. Oh, and then, um, sorry, and then we'll, we'll also um, hear from Abby after Lauren. Okay, sorry, thank you, go ahead, Sarah. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Parker Gibbons and um, I live on Terrace Street in Montpelier. Um, I live and work here and um, I'm here to speak as a community member and as a taxpayer. Um, I, I think it would, uh, it puts it mildly to say that I'm disappointed in, in the proposed budget. Um, I was looking at page 14 and, you know, if you look at these figures, um, you know, 3 million for police dispatch. And even if you separate dispatch, you're looking at like just over 2 million <clears throat> for police, it's the largest number in this budget. And then you go down to community, which is at um, just over 500,000. Um, or say, if you look at the senior center, which is at 134,000, um, <clears> which the senior center I know provides um, valuable services to community members. Um, so just looking at these these numbers, I guess um, it just raises questions for me. Uh, two two questions, and and I would hope that it would raise these questions um, for you too as council members. You know why are we investing so heavily in police? Why is the largest money going to to police? And um, and why are we not investing more in community services, like like affordable housing, like food security, making making sure people can eat, making sure people have a roof over their head, um, you know, education, human services. Um, yeah. So I would respectfully ask you to um, to not approve this budget. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lauren and then uh, Abby and then Constantinos. Yeah, I just, um, I can comment more later, but just on this point, um, I know that a couple kind of concerns last time had been raised and it, it might be in the, in the vein of Sarah's comment as well. Just, there was not a philosophical or a different charge given to the police department compared to every other city department. Like there's been this, kind of um, assessment based on the quirky numbers for the year that we asked for austerity from every department, but then we increased the police budget. And I, you know, Bill just went through the details of why that was not the case, but I, I just feel like, it, like I, I'm confused looking at all of it. So I imagine some people are still a little confused, but just, we were given, you know, across the board, every single department, I think, had similar, you know, holding positions open and a similar outcome, um, including the police department. And I, you know, I hear the the concerns and would just, um, again, say that there is a, a deep dive going into um, understanding what are we spending on our police? Um, what are our police spending their time doing? And a whole bunch of questions. And that analysis is happening at the police review committee that I encourage everybody to attend and participate. And help shape um, the, the vision and uh, the, the recommendations that that committee is going to be making. Um, it's not ready right now, um, but that is happening. So I hope people will get engaged in that and happy to share um, the details of how people can do that. I'll weigh in more later, thanks. Thank you. Um, Abby, go ahead. Hi, my name is Abby German. My pronouns are they, them, and I live in Montpelier, Vermont. Um, after listening to your rebuttal last week and tonight regarding the public outcry to defund the police, I feel deeply disappointed with my city leadership. 
apart from the fact that the city council manager or budget manager created the budget behind closed doors, which is a whole other issue, a claim that you have made is that the city is not really increasing the police budget from last year. It only appears that way while it is really remaining the same. Remaining the same is not enough. It is unacceptable to continue to fund an anti-Black colonial institution that originated as slave patrol. And for you to think that this is somehow acceptable is incredulous to me. The fact that this was your defense to the public cry for defunding the police shows me that the city of Montpelier is more interested in preserving the status quo of insidious racism in our institutions than it is in actually being the liberal, accepting, and welcoming place that it claims to be. I fear that white exceptionalism is plaguing the council, the belief that somehow our town is different or our police are different than others in our nation. Many Vermonters would like to believe that racism isn't a problem here, that racism is something that happens somewhere else. And there's no denying that Vermont by some measures is a very progressive state. However, when we look at the data, we find that Vermont is not the different liberal haven that we would like to believe that it is. Here are some staggering facts about racial profiling and state sanctioned systemic violence against black people in Vermont. Vermont currently leads the entire nation with one out of every 14 adult black men incarcerated in our state. Recent data from traffic stops shows that after being stopped, black drivers are four times more likely to be searched than white drivers, although white drivers are more likely to be found with contraband and black drivers are two times more likely to be arrested. Black people make up only 1.4% of our state's population while making up 8.5% of Vermont's prisoners. This data shows me and hopefully shows you that whether we like it or not, Vermont is racist. And it's past time that we take an aggressive stance against systemic racism beyond the performative allyship of painting Black Lives Matter outside the state house. It's time to show up for black people in our actions and values. And that starts with defunding the police. So echoing Sarah, I would ask the council not to approve this budget without significantly defunding the police. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Constantinos. I did it. Hi. My name is Constantinos Tavares, and I'm a resident of District 2. Uh, I had actually prepared a separate set of remarks, but after I saw last week's hearing, I, I was kind of disappointed in what transpired. Uh, but first, I just want to echo all the public comments so far today and last week that are asking to reallocate our community resources away from the police into services uh, and resources that have positive effect on the quality of life of our entire community. Uh, for example, reallocating two FTEs from the police department would be about $200,000 that can fully fund the housing trust fund and even fill one of our DPW vacancies. DPW was even in here back in November uh, telling you all that they couldn't effectively maintain our infrastructure, neither now or in the future. Uh, and to add insult to injury, they even said that they have difficulty recruiting and maintaining uh, and retaining staff because their wages are low. Uh, and that was never mentioned in any of the budget workshops um, when you were discussing the budget. Uh, it's also obvious the police don't need those two FTEs. One of them is already vacant. Uh, we can probably attribute that to the SRO position not being funded, but the other officer is the one collaborating with uh, federal um, law enforcement, uh, which again, isn't providing services here in our community, but assisting federal law enforcement, whatever it is they do, whether that's tearing apart families and putting children in cages and whatnot. So, um, you know, and working with the feds is also uh, contradictory to the department's fair and impartial policing policy. Uh, but that's kind of beside the point anyway. Um, last week after public comment, the first person to speak was the city manager, uh, not one of the elected officials. So this rebuttal before our elected officials uh, got a chance to speak, I feel kind of poisoned the discussion because I think it's hard to go up against someone in the administration uh, when they make uh, remarks. It's, I don't know how comfortable you would feel uh, if your boss or someone that you really respected said something and you opposed it. I don't know if you want to oppose it publicly. Um, Something else was um, in December, uh, the city manager held a budget Congress with his staff, uh, if that's correct, right? Yeah. 
so I, I believe that's where most of the budget decisions were made. Um, and that, that Congress was not open to the public. There were no minutes, no notes. Uh, nothing was ever released to justify those decisions made. The council never questioned any of those decisions in the base budget. And it seemed like you spent most of your time discussing small changes like the homelessness task force and other items labeled as other services. Uh, and the city manager even suggested you make those changes in the narrative. The budget options worksheet you were provided also doesn't give you the option or opportunity to consider any of these, uh, any, anything in the base budget other than the other services with the exception of the capital plan. Even today's presentation is just an accounting method difference as Councilor Richardson explained, uh, and not actual or reflection of the increased budget for the police. So sure, it might not have been 10.4% that it increased, but it still stands that other departments have been effectively reduced or level funded while the police department was still increased. So it seems no one really wants to stand up and hold the city manager accountable for his decisions. He's not elected and there's no way for the public to hold him accountable. That's your job, council and mayor. Uh, and it, it doesn't seem like you're doing that. Uh, and I hope you don't take this as a criticism of the city manager because it's not. I think he's doing a good job uh, and he's in a situation where he needs to be taking direction from you, uh, the policymakers, uh, and that's what he's doing. But you, it seems you're not questioning him uh, and asking him for justifications of his decisions. So this is on you, city council and mayor, to make sure that unelected officials are actually being transparent with the public and accountable to us. So for me, this budget was created in the dark. It was never questioned by those of you charged with policymaking power and actually fails to provide resources and services to our community in times when it needs it most. It doesn't even address the goals and priorities contained in the budget document itself. This is not a budget I can vote for on town meeting day. Uh, I'd also like to point out that you didn't even try to you know, entertain any adjustments to the budget today based on any public comments made, as, made because the language and numbers for the budget is already included in today's agenda. Um, and to my knowledge, based on any of these public discussions that I've been following, there have been no adjustments to the budget based on any comments from the public. So it seems like, you know, the actions that you've been taking have shown that these budget hearings and public comments in general to you are really kind of a farce since nothing changes from it. Okay, thank you. Um, other comments? Yeah, Steve Whitaker here. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, I want to commend the well-organized speaker immediately before me. Um, I couldn't have said a lot of those things better myself. Uh, the fact that, let me use it as a an, uh, comparison. Uh, our Senator Polina got some statute inserted in the state budget, which is being ignored, um, but it requires active participation in the budget development process to get the priority of the public's goals embedded in the budget. And that's directly what's not happening. We don't have that as our uh, municipal, you know, ordinance or whatever about how the budget is created. But that's in effect what the prior speaker was asking for, that we define the priorities of the budget and not just let the city manager do it. And as far as transparency, I want to uh, remind or uh, belabor the point that the records, the records I asked for prior to the year end, uh, I granted a generous extension so the city manager could go on vacation. He comes back, he produces some records uh, a couple days ago, and in what those records I find that he just subbed it out through Kelly to this v 3 contractor who used useless uh, search terms and didn't even apprise me or run those search terms by, such as console or Motorola. So this, that was all useless. And, and Bill has to start it, the search again today. Uh, again, I recommended both console and Motorola. Uh, he, he put Motorola in and ignored console and said, I'm doing it again. But I'm not prepared for tonight's public hearing because of that lack of transparency and lack of competency. And that's just really unconscionable. Um, I, I'm not going to belabor the point because it starts to get personal. But I want to point out that I have done more research on that issue. The, uh, the three new 7,500 IP consoles are not just 135,000 as uh, Bill just stated. It's 135000 a year for the next three or four years. Okay, so this is a three or $400,000 commitment. 
prior to the Televate independent expert assessment of what our needs are coming in. And that's just irresponsible. It also, the only need for those IP consoles would be if the the main feature of the IP switching is that it can immediately switch to a remote site, such as our backup site, if Barry is willing to be our backup site. But Barry is nowhere near voting or approving uh, that kind of expenditure in this year's budget. So we're proposing to prematurely buy these consoles uh, that have not been uh, vetted or analyzed by anyone other than take take Bill's word for it, take Fred Cummings' word for it. That is that is unconscionable. The, the, the few documents I've pulled out of public records requests show that the planning was not done. The need is not there. We bought new consoles five years ago. CVPSA paid for one of them. Those consoles have at minimum a 10-year life. You can even squeak 10, 15 out of them. Motorola has discontinued them in favor of the new one, but a Motorola rep was is on record speaking to a public safety authority saying, buy a few spare parts, you'll get five more years use out of those. So I'm not asserting that we will, especially if we the Televate report comes out and says we need to have a backup site in Barry and the IP console might be better suited, but that we're not there yet. So to be funding new equipment, which Bill says we're not funding new equipment, at $135,000, which is only the first down payment of three or four years, uh, is really irresponsible. And I, I agree that the way we've got our process organized, we don't take input at the Budget Congress or whatever you call it, the back the private meetings, and that in effect it's the hurdle. The uh, it's not a rebut it's a rebuttable presumption that everything's just fine and I hadn't given all the testimony and others last budget hearing. And it's like, thank you, Go, uh, vote to approve. You know, that's a slap in the face to the pretense of public particip meaningful public participation. I mean, the people that I'm out here doing the work and doing the deep research that, that you all ought to be doing or that you should require an independent, uh, you know, re retain. Anyway, I think you got my point. I won't belabor it. I have spoken to several, and I think this is this is one area where you can uh, take some action without harming anything. There's no evidence at all, other than a little bit of hearsay, that the sky is falling and we need new new consoles. You know, we we just replaced the phone system in, in a few short years, so we should not be having our technology decisions made by self-interested staff who like new toys and don't do good planning and don't have over adequate oversight. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rebecca uh, Delgin, go ahead. Um, hi, my name is um, Rebecca Dalgan, and um, I live on Greenwood Terrace. Um, I use she, her, uh, she, her pronouns. Um, and I wanted to express my deep concern over the large amount um, of our taxpayer dollars that are going to funding the police. Um, you know, I know the council puts a lot of work into supporting this community, and I feel like all of you seem like really caring and compassionate people. I've met with one of my rep uh, council representatives, and she was kind and approachable and listened. Um, and I, you know, I love to, I loved hearing about the community fund, and you know, these are things I love about our community. And um, I am just sort of devastated with how the conversation around policing has, has gone. Um, and honestly, really feeling really angry about it. And tonight, uh, particularly feeling angry as I've been sort of trying to research what is, was going on with the police and the budget and trying to get my ducks in a row to um, speak coherently to all. Um, and uh, being interrupted by my two-year-old uh, constantly. And I think then I just started feeling uh, more angry and, and heartbroken because um, what I was really thinking about um, is knowing what it's like to be a parent with the, all the worry and heartache and joy and lack of time that comes with that. And then not even being able to imagine what it would be like to be a parent of a black child, but just 
thinking, what if on top of all of that, all of those things, you had to tell your child that like their life, um, you know, they had to fear for their life and their body um, from the from from an institution that theoretically is protecting us. Um, so. Um, to see this budget is, is devastating and I think it's hard because what I've seen over and over again is people come to these council meetings and and speak about the kind of reform we want and the response that I feel like we've been getting um, to me has felt kind of has felt paternalistic and and paltry and um, you know what I've seen is that um, we've gone on to, uh, you've gone on to create the um, the committee to look into the police, um, which I felt excited about. But then I, I was disappointed when I found that um, that uh, the, the selection of the people to be on that, a lot of that decision making uh, was done behind closed doors um, and that not one of the people on that committee uh, was someone who had expressed a desire to abolish the police. Um, I was really pleased to hear tonight that um, Abby German will be joining that committee. Um, I do find it disconcerting that the objectivity of someone who might be an abolitionist was questioned when that same line of questioning was not, uh, at least during this forum, extended to the other person being considered to join the committee. Um, and I'm bringing this up um, because I just, I fear that that discrepancy in questioning is perhaps a bias uh, that may reflect some of the biases of this body and those brought to the budgeting uh, process and to this larger conversation. Um, and I'm not trying to be accusatory, but I it did raise a question for me. Um, so amidst all of this, uh, for our budget to continue to fund police in the way we are, it leaves me saddened and disappointed, though uh, honestly not surprised. Um, I'm asking you not to approve this budget without significantly defunding the police. If there's anywhere we should be putting our money, it's to make sure that the basic needs of our community are being met. The need for housing, for food, and for safety that makes everyone feel safe. I'm hoping that you'll take to heart what the citizens of Montpelier have come here to tell you tonight and last week and in the many meetings like this, uh, rather than just listening and then proceeding forward is already uh, what feels like sort of preordained and preplanned. Um, I, I wanted to uh, close my comment um, by sharing with you an art uh, just a quote uh, from an article um, in the Atlantic by um, Michael Denzel Smith. Um, this was an article called Incremental Change is a Moral Failure. Um, and uh, this is a, a brief quote from the article. He says, justice is a proactive commitment to providing each person with the material and social conditions in which they can both survive and thrive as a healthy and self-actualized human being. He goes on to write, I have grown past impatient with injustice. I'm incensed by the delusion so prevalent among the country's supposedly serious thinkers that tinkering around the edges of an inherently oppressive institution will lead to freedom. Thanks for your time and service. Much appreciated. Great. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, so I have some um, thoughts and comments about some of the things that were shared. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of the, the folks who uh, took the time to share your thoughts with us. Um, we, we do appreciate them, um, even if you know we end up making or not making some um, some changes. Um, I I just want to make sure that um, uh, I'm clear about a couple of things. Um, particularly a couple of things that uh, the last uh, speaker that Re Rebecca, you just uh, brought up for us. Um, so in terms of all the appointments, um, it is very typical for this body to make all appointments in what's called executive session, um, which is which is done behind closed doors, but that is um, so that the council can have candid conversations about the people that we're about to appoint. So, but that that is also consistent with um, appointments that we make to every other committee. Um, so, just just so you're aware of that, that is generally how that works. And um, you know, I I I I appreciate what you're saying about you know, uh, was my question for Abby um, you know conveying a bias? And I uh, I want to acknowledge that I, I thought about that before I asked. Um, because, but I, I went forward and asked anyway because she was the only one that had made um, 
that she uh, had expressed an opinion about um, the outcome of the, of the police um, of all the, the candidates that we um, had had interviewed previously. Um, but but thank you for that. And I, I appreciate you um, bringing that up. Um, uh, also on the um, on the topic of the police review committee, um, I think probably the, the the biggest thing that I am hopeful for for from that um, committee is to come up with um, some recommendations about um, you know what uh, what makes sense for policing in our community and want to acknowledge that the solutions that um, might make sense in other communities may not make sense for us, but that that we may need to do uh, may, might need to have other solutions that um, that were not, um, necessarily a part of other communities solutions, um, and want to be open-handed, uh, about, about what that might look like for us. Um, so, um, uh, having said that, um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, oh, actually there's, there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, there were, uh, I, I do want to make sure that everyone's really clear that should any council member want to make any adjustments to the budget, um, you can make that uh, proposal, that's fine. Um, I remember being on the council when um, we used to get more into the weeds on uh, particular line items. Uh, and the, the trend more recently has been not to do that, but we absolutely still can, and that is anyone's uh, prerogative to, to do that. Um, and, and that I just want to also point out that anyone is free to, to make a proposal for adjustments if you um, feel so moved. Uh, also, I um, appreciate the, the um, I, I really particularly appreciated how informed all of the, the um, comments were this evening. That was really um, helpful. Um, all right, so having said that, I do have one question. Um, which is about the console for dispatch. Um, can you help us understand um, why, like what state the console is in now or uh, the communications are in now that um, warrants uh, purchasing this new console now? Well, I can, although Chief Pete just popped on and I think he'd be better able to answer that than me. I, I would like to respond quickly to that though, um, which is, we have not made a commitment to buy the console. We put the money in the budget uh, and we understand that there's a process going that might suggest something else. So it doesn't foreclose that option. Uh, and certainly uh, when I said there was $135,000 in the console, it did not mean to, you know, I wasn't saying precluding that it also, that it's a multi-year commitment. We, I know that. Uh, so I, I feel like some of those some of those things maybe weren't weren't totally uh, there, but anyway, in terms of the details of the console, the chief is on. I think he can explain it better than I can. I would say that there were a number of requests that the police department put in, and um, when we needed to reduce budget, we basically gave them a number and said, "Here's what you've got. You please prioritize what um, what you can." what works for you within that number and this is what they selected. So, uh, so they prioritize it higher than anything else. So chief, can you respond um, to the, the thinking behind the console? Yes, sir. And good, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of city council, members of the public. Uh, so basically the, the, the console system that we're at right now is currently the system we have now is not, uh, is no longer uh, supported by Motorola. So they're not making, parts for it. It would be something that we would have to go out to see if we can scavenge systems if the if, if, if our consoles went down. Um, so basically, uh, we, we've had a couple of instances that we we had a scare. Um, and then this is how this is this is when it came to light. It was something that wasn't on our radar until a few months ago when we had a potential scare. And uh, when we when we were researching the parts and everything else to it is when we learned that the system was no longer supported. So basically, as it stands, uh, if the system goes out, uh, we we have no way of communicating uh, via dispatch. 
uh, with our console systems. Uh, if, if we we would have to go out to look for extra parts, um, those parts we would have to, to reach out to other agencies that may have had them in, in the past, find out which parts they may have to cannibalize the same system. So I would uh, kind of equate it to having a, a series of uh, failures within the roof point, uh, within a roof, and then uh, just moving forward from there. And I apologize, I'm a little discombobulated because I'm not feeling too well tonight. Um, but but yes, es essentially that that's where we are. So if we if our console systems go out with dispatch, we we lose all ability to to communicate outside, to be dispatched to calls, to get uh, and pretty much essentially everything would you know for 911 functions. And this is an operational issue. This isn't uh, a multi agency issue. It's it's something that that has to be done for the Montpelier Police Department. Thank you. Um, other thoughts or comments or questions? Yes. Yeah. Could I add some clarity to that? This is Steve Whitaker. Um, um, actually, before you go, Stephen, um, Dan had his hand up. So go ahead, Dan. Well, I, I just had a couple of follow up questions for the chief about the console, which is, um, you know, in light of the fact that CVPS is starting its um, examination of the dispatch infrastructure within the, the various central Vermont agencies, um, is this console, uh, would this, does this console preclude? Um, various systems, would it require uh, not only us, but other towns or cities to have the same type of system to communicate with um, is, is my first question. And then uh, maybe a second question about the, the cannibalizing of, of other sources. I mean, it, are you talking about only agencies or are there other sort of source, secondary sources, secondary markets for, for these type of parts? I know sometimes with older computers, there's secondary markets where you can get the replacement parts is the only resource the, um, you know, basically calling agencies with these machines in storage. Yes, sir. To, to answer the first question, no, it, it, it's, 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 it's a system that's, that's not going to require upgrades for, for an infrastructure or anything else like that. It's just essentially, uh, we just need a computer system to dispatch. Uh, it, it's not going to. It's not. A, it's not an upgrade for infrastructure or anything else like that to that effect. Um, and uh, and and for the the second part, yes, sir, it would be like the equivalent of like. Um, uh, first thing that pops into my mind is the old Tandy computers from Radio Shack. Um, we, we would have to reach out and maybe you know check out and see who's got the old Tandy sixteen hundred or six hundred or uh, Commodore sixty four and see if you know if, if they still have in play which specific parts we may need depending. And that's all. That's all. Keeping in mind the system goes down. We're going to have to get somebody to come in to diagnose it to find out which parts we need, then reach out to to find those parts, then have those folks send us those parts then pay for somebody to install those parts and then hope that the patchwork will last and moving forward. And maybe as, as a follow-up question, um, sorry, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, the Vermont judiciary for a long time till its upgrade had the same problem. And apparently one time the Supreme Court had to call Russia to get a, a replacement part on their, their database server. Um, but yeah, just from an emergency, Preparedness point of view: If if the console comes down, are there backup systems available? Um, I understand this is not a situation we want to invite necessarily, but I'm maybe just trying to understand too the the level of. I mean, is there a, sort of a backup generator, as it were, um, for the console system? To my understanding, as it was explained to me, no, sir. It would just be the system would, would be down, and we would have no way of communicating until we were able to locate. Uh, again, a system, have it installed uh, and moving forward from that point. Uh, Anne, can I comment? Um, I, I feel like we should probably let um, Stephen go and then and then Donna. Does that make sense? Um, okay, Stephen, go ahead. Okay, uh, I have I mentioned this at the last hearing and I don't and I've offered the, the paper documentation. Nobody's asked to see that surprisingly. Uh, the, Motorola discontinued this in uh, June of 2019, and in 2019, they made a presentation 
to another public safety agency, and they said clearly, we're going to discontinue this because we've got a newer, fancier model that makes more sense. They were also quietly making plans to buy the only competitor. If we really needed new ones, Abtech was just purchased. They're a lot cheaper than the Motorola's, and they're now owned by and supported by Motorola. But that's the base. The Motorola rep advised that public safety authority, you can get five more years out of this, buy a couple spare parts. Uh, the chief is woefully uninformed about this, and it, that's troubling uh, because of the reliance we put on that department, which means he's totally dependent on Fred Cummings. These are standard compact computers, the, the standard little $800 desktop, com desktop or power computer, standard power supplies that you can get down on the Barry Montpelier Road that swap out. So th this is not rocket science. The only thing special about these is the Motorola software, which they actually bought from somebody else. So this, you're being misled, and I'm uh, not saying intentionally by the chief, uh, but the idea that this would just be down, no, it, you, you, we have three of them, three of the consoles. If one of them goes down, the other two can do the dispatching while one power supply is swapped. I can swap a power supply in about 15 minutes. Been doing it for years. So this, I, this idea that the sky is falling, and this isn't 911 either, by the way. This, this is dispatch. 911 is handled entirely by the state since Doug Hoyt took Montpelier out of the public safety answering point business. So we need some institutional memory. We need some professional engineering advice that you all will believe. Because obviously you're not believing me, and I'm not believing the chief. So, because uh, I know more, uh, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, thank you, um, Donna, and then uh, Bob. Uh, Bob, you want to go first? No, go ahead. Okay. Well, I my understanding was when Public Safety Authority bought one of the three consoles for Montpelier. We also bought one for Barry, so there would be redundancy, and Barry and Montpelier would both have this particular model and could depend on one another as backup. And so if one upgrades, you no longer have that. It does impact one console talking to the other. The other thing, I really came tonight wanting to discuss removing this 135 from the budget because I feel there are a lot of questions that haven't been answered I do think it's important that we actually do consider in three months that the Public Safety Authority will have finished this need assessment and making its recommendations so that it would be done with more clarity and appropriateness. I feel we could put it back in should revenue go up, should we find out all the questions that I now have and we clarify things and then act on it. But for right now, I'm inclined to take it out of the budget. Thank you. Um, Bob, go ahead. Yes, I just want to remind folks, um, there's been a lot of discussion tonight about a failure of one of these systems and how the impact it would have on police communications. And I know uh, Chief P can speak more to this also, but a failure to one of these or any of these uh, consoles could have a major impact on police, uh, I'm sorry, fire or EMS, dispatching, communications, um, if, they, if one of those systems were down and we were to have a major incident in Montpelier or any um, of our 18 communities that uh, Chief Pete dispatches for, a failure of one of those systems could have a major impact on those services. So I want people to keep in mind, it's not just police communications, it's fire and EMS communications also. Um, Bill, go ahead. I just need to point out that you are not actually approving the purchase of this tonight. You're simply allocating a budget uh, and for a contract of this amount with the financing and else it would actually come to the council at some point. So presumably uh, this decision is something that can be talked about at a later point. If the CVPSA um, were to um, come up with an alternate solution, presumably we would need funding to purchase whatever that alternate system was going to be. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are certainly plenty of unmet needs, uh, equipment needs uh, throughout the city. Um, so I, 
you know, taking the money out of the budget and then adding it back in later, uh, seems to me we could, you know, if you choose not to buy this at some later point, when you have perhaps more information, um, I'm sure we could put it towards any of the number of other suggestions we've heard tonight from people where they could go, whether it's funding for community items or for roads or anything else. So, um, you know, obviously it's your call, but you, you know, this is 135,000 out of a $14 million budget. I, I'd say um, you're not committing to purchasing this particular model of console. You're budgeting an allocation of funding. Um, Dan, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I I tend to agree with with Bill's point, and this is sort of a philosophical point about budgeting, which is that if you if the money's not in the budget, you can't spend it. Um, so, regardless of this question, if the money's taken out, that's mm -hmm. simply one hundred thirty five thousand that doesn't get um, approved by the the voters, presumably, or or you know eventually collected. Um, when we go to spend it, and I, but I should say at the same time, I share Donna's concerns and some of the concerns that are expressed here, and certainly being on the CVPSA board, I, I, I believe that you know the fact that we've just signed a contract with Televate to look at the systems, you know, does say that you know we need to we need to think about we need to let that process play out before we make these purchases. But as Bill points out, we're not approving. The purchase of it with the purchase of this budget, and you know what we are what we are doing is we're saying, one hundred thirty five thousand has been identified by the department um, as a, a to spend on this dispatch need, um, and there's a certain level of trust in the departments that you know is not a blind trust or a trust that we go without question, but nevertheless. I think at least at this point, it, it makes sense to keep it in there. And if we have, if, um, you know, the Televate uh, review or, you know, further examination shows that this is not a good investment, we do have that opportunity to do so. And it touches a little bit upon, I think, you know, one of the earlier points of what people were talking about, which is, you know, the, the budget process, and I've been through a number of these in a number of different towns, um, you, you know what we're what we're planning in some ways is a big single number, which is the budget that we're allocating, and we're trying to identify, and we're trying to be careful and thoughtful about it in a city with this many moving parts. And as as Bill points out, you know this is a multi million dollar budget, so you know um, haggling over one hundred thirty five thousand is a, is important because it's more money that I'm going to see this year, um, and that any taxpayer is going to see this year just about. But it's still it's a small, small part. And um, I think, you know, this is the difficulty of, of the budget process is that we do rely upon professionals and we do re rely upon their advice and judgment. And that's why we hire. That's why we have a, a finance department as opposed to an elected city treasurer who does all of the budgeting finance. We, we ask for professionals because the numbers are big enough and complicated enough that we want to make sure it's in trusted trusted hands and I think we benefit from that as we saw tonight with the audit um, and the same thing goes for fire police to public works uh, and administration um, but it, ultimately at the end of the day a lot of these numbers you know can can change if the needs change as we saw over this past year as well with the with the fact that when when revenue went down the city was very responsive on budgets and so you know, a lot of this process is in flux and budgets don't necessarily occur when we're ready to make decisions on other policy things, but it's really about, do we have a nut, do we have a, uh, a, a pile of money, uh, to put it quite somewhat crassly, um, that can fund all of these priorities um, that we've identified. And if we change our minds, can be reallocated, whether it be, you know, uh, turned into community funding or other things. So I, I would generally support the 135,000 staying in the budget, but I think the message is pretty clear tonight that we have as a city council, some questions about this particular purchase. And certainly um, given our interaction with other agencies like CVPSA, um, we wanna be careful about expenditure. So thanks. Thank you.
Um, so just speaking for myself, I tend to agree with Dan on this one. Um, it also feels like I, uh, the, the kind of thing that, um, I would not be inclined to gamble with, <laughs> um, and that if there is a different model to be purchased, that there's still time to make that decision. Um, and rather anticipate um, having the funds to to purchase something like that if um, you know should it be necessary uh, so sorry I, I'm speaking for myself here um, other thoughts or comments uh, Jack go ahead yeah thank you um, I, I think this has been a good conversation I, I think that I've gotten I've learned more uh, certainly than I knew at our uh, at our last public hearing and I thought it was valuable. Uh, I had a conversation with Donna about this this afternoon, and I think she raises some very good questions as <coughs> as to uh, Dan and Steve about what we should be, how we should be spending this money for uh, for communications uh, equipment and systems. But uh, but Bill's right that this isn't. Uh, a proposal that we write a check to Motorola for uh, for the console, and and so I think it's prudent to it would be it would be foolish to spend the money right now when there are unknowns out there. But uh, I do think it's prudent to include it in the budget so that as uh, more more information becomes available, the CVPSA study is completed, we'll know what to do. Um, so that's how I feel about this particular item. Thank you. Um, other thoughts, comments? Yeah, very briefly, Madam Chair, a clarification. This is only, this is a three or $400,000 uh, commitment if it gets made, the Motorola, correspondence, which I got from emails, they were offering no payments for a year if you commit. And then first year, at the end of the first year is when the 135 comes due. So I think I would ask that you be really explicit that they don't take delivery on these until some further action of the council, because just by taking delivery, Motorola is offering a lease purchase with title residing with the city and the first payment not due for a year. But this isn't just a $135,000 commitment. This is a $400,000 commitment that is uh, inadequately planned and vetted. So uh, I think if you are going to amend the budget at all, either by removing the money for now or constraining the money that it cannot, it cannot pull the trigger without further action by the council, I would suggest you do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Jack, go ahead. And then Bill. I, I think that this, uh, what's being described to us is a, a arrangement where Motorola would get the city to sign a contract over a number of years to, uh, to spend a large amount of money for equipment purchases. And uh, that's the kind of thing that the manager would not do without the probably couldn't do, but certainly would not do without the approval of the council. I don't feel a need to uh, pass anything that says, Bill Fraser, don't you sign that contract and take uh, delivery of the consoles um, until we tell you you can. Yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say. The uh, multi-year financing agreement uh, for this level of money would require council approval. So we could not make that commitment without explicit vote of the council. Um, furthermore, I just also want to remind people that we're talking about funds that aren't available till July 1st. Um, so again, that's six months to evaluate choices. Uh, I don't know what the CVPSA schedule is, um, but anyway, so that, you know, they may not be that far apart. Great. Um, Donna, I do want to circle back to you. Um, if you uh, would like to make a motion, that is certainly your prerogative, if you would like to. 
I don't find the support in the council and I'm not surprised, but I am glad we had the discussion. And I certainly think we do need a clarifying uh -oh. answer. Are they frozen? Can you still hear me? Yes. So, uh, so uh, you know, I'm glad we had the discussion. I, I would like to say something to the other speakers tonight. Can I do that now? Can you hear me, Ann? Absolutely, go ahead. And, and that's just, I mean, you sort of yes, said it. Yeah, absolutely, go ahead. Sorry, I'm, my internet is cutting out. I just wanted the, the people who showed up to the hearings are appreciated, but we do have other residents who talk to us and we are trying to balance what the whole community wants as well as trying to nudge it in new directions. So I, I feel very good that we put the peer support counselor in, that we have the social worker, the equity consultant, and I do feel we put money and some efforts in housing. And I just keep thinking, we'll just keep moving and moving in that direction. So please support the things that are supporting your ideas behind reducing the funds in the police, but, and help us make changes. Uh, that's all, but thank you for coming. Thank you. Other thoughts or comments? Okay, uh, Jack, go ahead. Yeah, um, take, stepping back from this one uh, item to the overall budget, uh, this this ties in very well, I think, with the report we had from the auditors, where uh, where they said we we did well, we managed to have four thousand left dollars left over at the end of the year, and um, given. Given the, uh, you know, I know we have expectations for uh, for fund balances, and I know that uh, it's prudent to have reserves at a higher level than we have now. But it's also clear to me that it would have been irresponsible for us to hold back money and end the year with more than four thousand dollars in the bank because that would have meant that we were not funding services that were really essential at at, uh, at a really low point in uh, in the life of our city so um i, I do think we'll we'll need to uh, look at the fund balances and and a lot of other things in the future but uh, for this year i think we've got a responsible budget uh, to put before the voters Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, any other comments or questions about the budget? Okay, I am going to um, close the public hearing um, for this. And uh, is there a motion? Uh oh, sorry, I, I glitched there a little bit. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, is there a motion? Uh, uh, Jack, go ahead. I move the uh, that we adopt the budget and put it before the voters, including the uh, allocation from the uh, Vermont or the Montpelier Community Fund. I'll second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Uh, Lauren, and then Dan. Yeah, I just wanted to re reiterate, um, I'm really appreciative um, to the, the city staff. We had given direction to, you know, look with really tough numbers, a lot of hard decisions, um, really, you know, just echoing things we've discussed at previous meetings, but, you know, centering our staff and trying to maintain uh, you know, people in the positions to maintain services, to keep a focus on uh, services we're providing for the community and um, and then trying to plan for, you know, what kinds of opportunities might come if additional funding comes in and how could we be positioned to take advantage of that. And I think there was a lot of really good, thoughtful 
uh, thoughtful work and um, really trying to to center the the people in our community and the people on our staff in it. And I think the the staff did a great job trying to strike that balance. And it's a very um, I think responsible but also responsive to the moment budget. Um, you know, on the policing issue that I know a lot of people are on the line today listening about. You know, again, I really hope people will stay engaged, really hear the heartfelt pleas for quicker and more progress. Um, and, you know, we do have this process and, um, you know, welcome that input, I think, to get the kind of systemic change and long-term vision that people are talking about. I think it needs work. It needs analysis. We need to look at, you know, what would we do instead if we're going to reallocate money instead of just doing some kind of flashy statement um, in the budget, I'd rather do something that we know will actually work and make our community better. Um, so I, I look forward to that ongoing discussion and appreciate the pushes and the heartfelt <laughs> pleas for keeping a focus on that. Um, I know I plan to and look forward to that work and hope to have people stay really engaged in that. Um, but I'm really appreciative of the budget um, that has been put forward and um, will be supporting it. Thank you. Um, Dan. So, you know, it, in, in Vermont, every year, every town, every city re has to essentially approve its budget from zero. Whereas a lot of towns in the Midwest and the West start with last year's budget as approved and only, only put before the voters a question of increases. Um, you know, I think it's a, it, it's a process that um, forces us to really look each time. And um, I'll say that one surprise about this budget, um, and it's really a credit uh, to the staff that, that did take our direction and policy choices to heart, um, is that, you know, this is a budget that, I, this isn't necessarily a budget I would have thought would have gone the, the way it did. I would have expected, as, as, in, as I've seen in prior years, um, you know, points of, of contention, more, more, more consoles and fewer points where we um, sort of had agreement. But I think it's reflective of the fact that, um, you know, this budget is really in some ways about maintaining what exists. Um, and in that, you know, all of the city departments did an outstanding job of trying to hit each of those points to you know, come up with a budget that they could continue to provide services while not passing on increases uh, to the taxpayers. And that's a challenge um, because that in some ways is like trying to pull a rabbit out of a hat. Um, and so I really congratulate, you know, the city staff for, for the work that they put into this. Um, but, you know, to anyone, you know, listening tonight, it is, it is the budget process every year you know, we start next year, we're going to start at zero and we're going to have to build back up. Um, you know, we don't take necessarily for granted, but hopefully next year we'll be in a better position and we can have some of these more robust discussions. Um, I anticipate next year will be a year where the need will be greater, as Christine said, um, and there'll be more challenges. Um, but I'm really pleased and happy. And, and I, I think it's only because of the hard work that was put into this in advance that we're not, you know, trying to make the budget fit our policies and priorities um, because it's, it's largely there. So I, again, kudos to the, to the staff and uh, the good work. Great. Thank you. Any further comments, questions, discussion? Okay. Um, all right. Um, I am. Um, I just want to also express my my gratitude to the staff for um, for your hard work on this budget and coming up uh, with the, the, a budget that met all of our requests as well. Um, so, okay. Any uh, further discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 No. No, can you hear me? Oh dear. Okay. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, all in favor? There's a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh no. 
We all said I, and I'm st I'm still glitching. <laughs> Do we have to vote for it again? They all voted. We all voted. John's got it on the no minutes, hey. right, John? You did vote. Okay, great. Is um, it, is time anyone for a break? Any yes. Well, before we do that, anyone opposed to the budget? No one is opposed. Anyone opposed? Nope. No one's opposed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yes. With that, I think now is a good time to take a break. Um, everyone. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Everyone is here. Um, so we're going to come back from our break. Um, so the next item is uh, approving the warning. Um, for this item, I feel like I should uh, turn it over to John, unless there's um, someone else. Um, Madam Mayor, I just say that this is uh, when you approve the final ballot, uh, it's also an opportunity for anybody in the public to ask questions about items that are on the ballot. There was a question asked earlier about how, how the number was on the ballot for the budget. I'll just to be clear, we do that every year, but it's obviously can be changed. Uh, you, you already voted on that, but just to be clear, it's not assuming a final result. And um, so that's it. It's, um, and then obviously anything else you want to add or delete or whatever. All I have. Okay, uh, Jack. Go ahead, Jack. And the 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 dollar figure in Article Six is the uh, final amount from the school board. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments, questions about the warning? If you're looking for a motion. I sure, think. go ahead, Dan. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to approve the, uh, or make a motion to approve the warning um, as printed. Second. Okay, is there a second? I, yeah, I second it. Okay. All right, any further discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. Okie dokie. All right. So the warning uh, is passed. Uh, all right. And so we are up to uh, the review of uh, the second quarter strategic plan. Um, I assume this is either uh, Bill or Cameron. You'd assume correctly and you would... Um, and it's going straight to Cameron. <laughs> All right, let me get my screen shared. Um, I'm excited to share our quarter two updates with y'all. I'll make sure it's free. Uh, if I could share my screen, that would be great. All right. Hopefully y'all can see that. Yep. Yep, great. So um, we have come before you bef in uh, last couple months to give you our quarter one update, but um, we've done a lot since then. So this is gonna be an update on what we have done um, since qu the first quarter report. Also in your packet is the full report, which breaks down each goal and initiative um, by action uh, by person. And it gives you the last five updates. So it gives you a lot of history on what we've been doing and what the updates have been. But as a reminder, your strategic goals that you voted on to include in your strategic plan by a majority vote included community prosperity, COVID-19 response, environmental stewardship, more housing, responsive and responsible government, and sustainable infrastructure, which is, again, sort of what we have worked on as staff um, to prioritize um, in our work, in our work plans, and in our budget. So I'm really excited about our quarter two status. Um, we have hit 43% progress in our initiatives in the strategic plan, which is great. When I came to you first quarter, we were at 14%, which was a little behind sort of that 25% goal for each quarter. Um, we've got many of our, a majority of our initiatives are on track. We have a few delays, but most of them are COVID-19 related. Um, 
I'll get into that a little bit further. Um, and a good majority, a good uh, quarter of them have been completed. So we've completed a fair few um, initiatives right on schedule for what they were anticipated to be. So we're very excited, um, very close to our goal of 50% completion for this update, which is great considering the challenges a lot of the staff have been up against. So I'm going to jump right into the goals and give you updates on each initiative. If you have any questions, please just go ahead and stop me. Um, so under community prosperity, one of the goals uh, are the budget process, which we've sort of just rounded the corner on for that. The status is great. We're doing on track with that. Uh, our new initiative since last time is we developed and implemented a survey that went live in December and closed in January. We had um, responses in the hundreds, as you heard earlier. Uh, briefings were given to y'all. The budget process has been, um, we think, pretty engaged this year. Uh, the budget was submitted to y'all for consideration early December, and the warning was just approved. We also have all of the details line by line. Um, everything can be found on the city's website. So we have a few initiatives under COVID-19 response. All are on track right now. Um, the sort of the highlights from the supporting the community in the rebound from COVID-19 is that the city has received almost $200,000 in funding. Uh, most of that is um, money that we're receiving back. We've paid for it. We're getting money refunded to us, but we've been really continuing to work on our policies and our internal procedures around COVID-19. We did when the governor changed his travel policies and some other guidance about gathering. We did create new policies around leisure travel for staff. So they have to let us know if they plan on traveling out of state. Not saying that if they can't, just gotta let us know. And we've been working very closely with our neighborhood partners, including the capital area neighborhoods who've been very supportive of us getting information out in ways that we normally don't have access to. So they're doing more boots on the ground communication than we have the capacity for, which we really appreciate. Um, they've also since then really set up uh, neighborhood information kiosk, which I'm sure you all have seen around. They're the sandwich boards in some neighborhoods with information on it. And that has been really invaluable for us. Um, as far as MDC and the Montpelier Alive partnerships, we've really discussed a lot of that within the budget process. The funding for MDC has continued to be an issue in this budget process and the recommended budget had a zero dollar funding for MDC. I've moved on to environmental stewardship. We've got our net zero goals for the 2030 plan. And I think, you know, we got a little update on that before, but, um, you know, we, you have awarded a contract to the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation for the net zero 10 year action plan. Um, so they're anticipating to come back in the spring. So that's very exciting. The updates to the stormwater master plan is sort of on, um, it's sort of in status right now waiting um, for further updates related to the committee reviewing the stormwater utility option. So that will be coming at a later date. So right now that is on hold until that comes together. Next goal is for more housing, the implementation of the city plan housing initiatives. Um, they've updated it to let you know that the housing task force has been meeting. They met in November and they don't currently have a work plan for their fiscal year for fiscal year 21 to dis, to discuss the budget. Um, they also, however, have been talking to both the housing task force and the planning department about the Municipal Administrative Procedure Act, which um, is a sort of more stringent and um, more definitive path to getting permitting through. So there'll be more information and more um, presentations on that in the future, but let they just wanna let you know that they are talking about that and what that means to implement. Um, so there's also uh, work on zoning to remove barriers for additional housing. And as you know, their recommended budget was approved for $50,000 for the housing task force. So all that work is still on track according to their goals. Regarding responsive and um, responsible government. We have the lobbying subcommittee that is on track. Uh, the newest update is that our office, the city manager's office, is aiming to prepare a tracking tool to report on issues that you have voted for within your 
legislative agenda. So we wanna make sure that we're staying on top of it so that y'all can stay on top of it. As far as the child care options study, the current Capital Kids After School programming it, program is successfully continuing. Um, we're seeing uh, great responses from the folks that are involved in that. I've also asked the recreation staff to work on the child care option study for infants and young children. Um, they did want to call out that uh, the facilities that we currently have, it would be very hard to upfit those. So I'm just sort of priming you for that report. But we're also going back to our contractors for the rec facility updates that we were proposing um, and try to work in maybe some of those child care options to be able to support infant care. Um, as far as sustainable infrastructure, the initiative to protect, maintain, and improve built infrastructure. This is um, one where we have some delays, but we also have some completions. So some of the projects that were slated to um, be finished were finished, including some paving and some crack sealing work, the Chestnut Hill stormwater improvements, and Clarendon Avenue's road reconstruction. So very pleased and thanks to DPW for getting those done. Their newer updates include that Taylor Street is waiting to install some lights that need to go up. Uh, that is planned to be completed entirely in November 2021. Um, Granite Street sidewalk repairs. Staff is currently working on bid documents, so that is moving forward and is on schedule. There are two disruptions. The Grout Road Bridge has a major disruption as um, there is no funding for that currently. They are planning on submitting a grant application this April and start raising the funds and sourcing the funds to narrow that gap. The uh, Moat property, which you're now calling 16 Main, um, we're still aiming to do the paving and the finishing of that lot as well, and we're waiting on the contractor availability. I couldn't tell you if that is because they don't have staff or if it's a COVID-19 issue, but the contractor's not currently available. And I've got another part of this to sort of go over, but I wanted to pause for any questions or comments. I sort of blew right through that. All right. So the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, this is great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. So um, one of the exciting things about Invisio, the program that we use to track our strategic plan, is that it has the option for a public dashboard. So I've been um, doing training with Invisio to work out how the dashboard works so I can operate it. Um, so I now feel comfortable bringing it to you as an option to go live. Um, so I wanted to preview it with y'all before it goes live. I wanted to give you this update before I update the website, but um, the public dashboard is really a way for our residents to get a look at what work we've done towards your goals um, that you've identified in your strategic plan. Um, it also allows uh, us to update as needed. So it's not like a live update. The thing is, it's sort of a misnomer to call it a website. It's just a, it's a dashboard is what it is. So it doesn't live update. Like if I go in tomorrow and write an update on one of my initiatives, it doesn't show up on this dashboard. So that's an important note and a distinction to make. My goal is to update it so it shows all of the recent activities after I give you guys the quarterly updates. So it will be updated quarterly so the folks can see it over time. So um, it is not real time, but it's more information out there than we had before. So I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so I'm really hoping this works. I have the um, preview website that I'd like to share with you. Is it still the PowerPoint or can you see the website? It is still PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Okay. Still PowerPoint. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to open it back up. Okay. Can you see the website now? Yep. Yes. 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 So this is what it will look like if it goes live. Um, uh, it's got a nice splash page. It links, it sort of explains what the strategic plan is. There is a link to our full departmental strategic plan, which goes in department by department, what their work plans are. Again, this is sort of a strategic plan based on a triangle. Our staff has work plans that build into the department work plans. 
which have been formed around your pr top priorities. So it's sort of a, y'all set your top priorities. We um, work, our work plans are out around those. And then our staff sort of builds up and flows up into those. So um, there are other strategic initiatives floating around out there. It also states that this is going to be updated quarterly and is not a live update. But if you go in further down, you can see each of your um, strategic plan goals. I will click into the COVID-19 response. It's the middle of my screen. And then it shows you uh, what the goal is, what the initiative is, and then what the updates are. So um, it sort of tells you everything that's been going on. It tells you if it's on track, what the status is what the percentage is, and you can go up here and you can click through to see what else is up there if you don't want to click the back button. So I'm pretty excited about this. I think it's a, a real big step um, to further our transparency around this. I know that before my time in the city, this was live um, before, but I think we're utilizing Invisio in this program in a much more robust way. So I think this is a uh, going to be a much more intuitive way to to check in on what this what the city is doing to further council's goals. I, I'm not looking for any action, but more like yes, this is great, or any feedback that you have on this if you want to see any changes before. I bravo, move. bravo! <laughs> Thank you. I think this is great. I I regularly have people yeah. asking me what's going on with whatever and. Mm -hmm. uh, It'll be great to be able to send people to say, look, I can, here's what's going on. Go and the city's telling the whole world what, what we're doing and what we're accomplishing. Thank you. Dan, go ahead. Well, I just wonder if there shouldn't be some disclaimer though about the fact that it's updated quarterly as opposed to immediately because I could see some confusion arising out of mm -hmm. that. Well, I did, I tried to, I put in the preamble, so when you go to the website, it says the city's progress on these goals are updated quarterly, January, April, July, and October. So hopefully I, I, I can find a way, if I can format the language, I'll make that bigger. I'll stand that out a little further. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's just important so that somebody can sort of see it, you know, uh, have it jump out at them only because I think that would be a, a likely response and and would undercut what I what I agree with my other counselors is a really good a good improvement towards transparency. Yeah, yeah this I, is I, great. I mean, I sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Ann. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. that. In terms of transparency, I think it's fantastic, and I think with um, information like information needs to be immediate on the web, and so on. If I would not worry about a preamble, or I can be, I think it's important to say that it's updated quarterly, but more mm -hmm. important would be on the page that somebody is looking, it tells you when it was last updated. So if it said just when it was last updated, then they'll know, like, okay, all right, and when to expect the next update. I think if even if you build that into the language of how you're um, writing that out, like, folks. Right. You don't even want to be one click away, but ultimately, I think this is really a great step around transparency, and and I certainly applaud the effort and and appreciate it. it, it the the site looks good and easy to navigate, and so um, I could really see use all of us being able to utilize it to be able to share information with folks in the city. So thank you. Great, thank you. That's good feedback, and um, I will mess around with the widgets to see if I can get the date to pop up on the update section. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I find this uh, uh, pretty satisfying, <laughs> pretty encouraging. Um, it's, uh, it's been a goal of mine anyway for a long time to have more data available from the city. And, and um, you know, while this is not necessarily like community metrics or whatever, it's still like putting out there um, how we're doing in terms of progress on our goals. So um, that is fabulous. Um, other, other thoughts or comments? I just want to give a big tip of the cap to Cameron on this and all of our team, but you know, she led the progress, the, the process uh, this spring with, with all of us to develop the plan and also work through with all the department heads and the activities and led our internal process as well. 
as she mentioned, we did have Invisio a year or two before. This is kind of where I'd hoped we'd get with it, but we couldn't seem to to get there. And she really has taken it and owned it and, and run with it. And uh, we're all using it. You know, we use it as part of our conversations to track ourselves internally. Um, so it's, I think it's finally doing what we'd hoped it would do when we first when we first purchased it. So um, thanks to Cameron and thanks to you all, those of you that were here before that supported buying this software. Thank you, Bill. Great. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or questions on this? Okay. And you're not looking for any um, motion on this. Uh, so no, nope. uh, so um, I I'll send it out as soon as it's live. I'll make sure that we do a big, um, good uh, public information push on it. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And you'll get another right. one in the third quarter. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I think that is the end of our regular business for the evening. So we are up to council reports. Uh, Donna, are you up for going first? Uh, yes, I'd like to bring the council back to some of the ideas I was talking about housing and empty buildings. And I did get into a great discussion with, oh, my battery's low. I'll talk fast. Uh, a great discussion with Washington County Mental Health and Heaton Street. They have a building there that used to be dormitories for the hospital across the street. They adapted it to offices, but there's still all that plumbing's there. And they're in the midst of exploring, assessing their facilities. So Mary's really on board. And I've, I've been in touch with Rick on from Come Good Sam, and she, they're gonna join the discussion. So I'm looking to all of you in the public to give me names of people who might be interested in looking at different buildings throughout the town, county, that might be applicable to helping us with housing. And the other thing I want to say is a big thank you to Cameron. I love getting that one email with the link to the meeting and the executive session because I inevitably have trouble coming back in and I didn't tonight. So thank you. Uh, Connor. All right, let's talk my ride after uh, about a couple of weeks on the ground here. We've had 250 different people sign up for accounts, about half of those using it actively. 11% um, of people who have signed up have used it over five times, which comes out to about 45 bookings a day. Um, people are waiting an average of like seven minutes, and it's tracking uh, four and a half out of five stars. I've been told the mayor has used it. Uh, pretty much every day to get the work too. So uh, there was a feather in the cap. Every a lot of bumps day. To, <laughs> a lot of bumps to iron out still, uh, but I think it's a good time to do it while the state employees um, aren't in town, you know, and we can really, really give it a deep look there. Other than that, just want to thank MPD and the rest of city staff uh, for keeping us all safe over the last week there. I know there was a lot of anxiety about it, but, um, you know, no regrets putting out the messages we did and uh, just glad everybody's safe and sound. So that's it for me. Thanks. Connor, I uh, ask a Dan, go ahead. Or, sorry. No, sorry. Go ahead. I was looking at you, Jack. And I said, Dan, go ahead, Jack. <laughs> Connor, Connor, do you know how that 45 uh, riders a day compares to uh, the ridership on the uh, fixed uh, route? buses that were replaced having a clue jack yeah. okay thanks sorry donna did you have a question oh, i was just gonna say that kind of data will come later this is just very preliminary ridership Great. they had a lot of information about different uh unique individuals and whether they were going to work or shopping i mean it really was a lot of data i can pass on to you jack well that'd be great thank you All right, uh, Jay. Yeah, um, I thought it'd be a good time just for a quick update on the SRO committee. Um, the work continues. It's been, um, there's been a lot of meetings and a lot of engagement. Um, we're getting to a point now next week where we're going to be um, deciding how to present information to the board um, so that they the school board so that they may be able to make a decision at the beginning of February. Um, as it stands now, it's looking like there won't necessarily be a specific recommendation coming from the committee, but rather a sharing of findings and data. Um, and so we're, there's 
you know, a need to, to um, the committee has work to do to figure out how to best and most efficiently share those findings. Um, so it's been a real collaborative process thus far. Um, and I'll certainly keep folks updated on, on what these next steps are with the school board. Great, and that's thank it. you. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, uh, Dan. I I have very little to report. I'll just simply say that if anyone out there needs uh, any dose of optimism or hope about the world, just replay the clip of Amanda uh, Gorman's poem at the inauguration. Um, couldn't have asked for anything more wonderful as a gift this week. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, uh, Jack. A um, <clears throat> couple of things. One, I uh, want to praise and appreciate all the uh, pre planning and pre preparedness that uh, Chief Pete and Captain Nordenson and all the uh, local public officials went through in uh, getting ready for the uh, <clears throat> problems that did not occur, but I would, at any time, I would rather be prepared for something bad that didn't happen than to be unprepared for something that did. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's uh, a tribute to the uh, Montpelier police that they were able to call out to police agencies all around the area and uh, get volunteers from all over to come in and help out. I was in signing liquor licenses the other day and I had a conversation with, uh, with the captain who was in there uh, in the conference room making calls to everyone he could make to get people, you know, one or two people at a time to get in there. And so good job, Chief and the whole police department. Um, and the other thing, which is also a good job observation, I just want to mention and I just noticed this today in uh, tonight in in the meeting. How many times we uh, we hear some report or presentation from Bill Fraser, and he's always always giving credit to department heads, the assistant city manager, people who are working through the city, he's ne he always gives credit to the uh, to the people who work for us. And I think that's great. And by the same token, we've never heard Bill, when there's a mistake made, we've never heard Bill say, yeah, that was someone else who screwed that up. Um, always takes uh, responsibility for any mistake that's been made, always gives credit where credit is due to the uh, to the people who work for the city instead of uh, taking it for himself. And I really appreciate that. Thank you, Jack. It's a pretty simple formula. They all do the work and I take the blame. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, all right, uh, Dan. No, uh, Lauren, sorry. <laughs> um, only thing I just wanted to raise, um, it, it came up earlier, but really do want to think about, and maybe it's the lobbying committee getting together. I don't know the right process, um, but I know we are, um, you know, at a point where I know I've been like, feeling very Pollyanna-ish with like federal stimulus money, but now that it actually looks like there are real opportunities there, you know, how are we ready with our list? I've been having conversations with some of the federal delegation folks. And I mean, they are like, give us projects, give us specific ideas for things. And I'm thinking of like our CSO, district heat, like are there things that we could be um, putting in right now? We, there's a template they're asking for um, specific projects like. Apparently they're doing more like earmarky kind of things this year. And we certainly have some very well positioned um, senators. So I, I think I would love to, any way I can be helpful in that process or I wanna make sure that we're, we're doing that work and positioning ourselves as best as possible to take advantage. Um, so there's like the short-term COVID response stimulus, there's budget 
reconciliation upcoming opportunity. There's the fiscal year 22 budget that, um, so it sounds like there's like a series of opportunities and then a more um, stimulus infrastructure um, later this spring. So I think, you know, we could do some work soon and then also kind of ongoing work on this, but definitely want to make sure that we're just ready and putting ideas forward so we can take advantage to for whatever whatever we can what we've got it couldn't be um in a better position with our <laughs> with our senators um and then just in that vein as well um now that the newest budget estimates and stuff from our uh, state level it could be good time to think about when we would re-invite our um state our state senators and reps to revisit with us um, and, and talk about what they're seeing and, you know, how to stay engaged with them um, for, you know, making the best for the city as well. So just getting that back on the agenda. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't have um, very much for an update today. Just um, what a delight and breath of fresh air the inauguration was. Um, that was huh, really fantastic. Um, and uh, I guess I'll leave it there uh, for me. Um, John. Oh, I don't know if I really have anything to say other than um, um, the filing deadline for candidates is going to be five o'clock on Monday. And as soon as we get that in, there's a 530 meeting of the Board of Civil Authority Got to send out a link uh, to draw lots for that. Still not sure how that's going to work virtually, but we'll figure something out. As far as, you know, lots for order on the ballot, sorry. And then they're off to the printer Monday night. So uh, we'll see. We're doing this whole thing. Soup to nuts, mail in in a compressed um, compressed time frame. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it will go well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Bill. Thank you. Um, so I also would like to thank the chief, um, Chief Pete and whole MPD and also uh, state police, Capitol Police and all the neighboring police people. I actually was on a VLCT meeting today. I got to thank Commissioner Sherling directly um, for coming, you know, for, for working very hard to protect us. Uh, as, it, as we said, uh, it turned out that um, not nothing happened, but that doesn't mean it couldn't have if perhaps if people had seen us unprepared. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, you know leadership from our police department, which I appreciated uh, to pull together the teams. And uh, so all to all involved and to the community who who paid attention. And uh, we had a great sort of uh, robust group here uh, in front making pancakes. Uh, those wild Antifa people feeding people, and um, but they stayed here and not at the state house, so we appreciated that. Um, funny, uh, Councilmember Hurl just mentioned lobbying. We just had this conversation end of last week about tracking the agenda and trying to figure out how to make sure we could see where, where that was going. And I think it's a great idea to maybe get our folks back in and try to roust up a meeting with our committee now that budget is temporarily behind us. And most importantly of all, I, I do, this is going to be another one of thanking some of it. I, I've got to thank Cameron. She's the one that did the Bernie picture in the council chamber. And uh, I think that's gotten the most attention um, for our city's website and council meeting notice that we've had in a long time. So, and it was very well done. <laughs> and that's all I've got. Great. Yeah, I agree. That was, that was awesome. <laughs> um, all right. So I think that is the end of our um, ag agenda for the evening. So without objection, I will consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. So long, all. Have a good evening. Mayor, good can, I, can I ask a question of you real quick? Nothing to do with this. Sure. Did you manage yeah. to sign the resolution that we had um, from last meeting? We put it at the police department. Are you able to? Oh, I, I probably didn't, but I can. I can pop over. Okay. We the grant is due tomorrow at four, and we need your signature oh. on that document. Okay. Okay. I when um, we could also I could also scan it to you and maybe a, a digital signature. Would that work? 
Um, that's fine. I why don't I just plan on popping over to the police department? I'll just I'll just do that. Can we can we have someone run up to the high school? Or? Yeah, I can bring it to you. Oh my gosh, that would be okay. Entirely I'll do that. too convenient. I'll okay. Do that. Thank okay, you. well, I'll be there all day. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Easy. Yeah, no problem. My right.